Okay, let's get underway. I'll call to order the September 30th regular meeting of the Board of Directors of the Golden Rain Foundation. Uh, Deborah, roll call. Certainly, Walker. Here. Stonefilm. Here. Hamaji. Here. Hart. Here. Benley. Here. Brown. Here. Clarity. We just had you here. I'm sorry. Here. <laughs> Thank you. Harrington? Here. Madaraki? Here. O'Keefe? Here. Okay. Thank you, Deborah. Uh, you all have received minutes from the last meeting of August 26th, as well as the September 14th and 15th joint meeting of the Board and Finance Committee. Any re revisions or comments to those minutes? Okay. Seeing none, they are approved as submitted. Thank you, Deborah. Uh, we are always pleased that uh, the city of Walnut Creek comes to attend our board meetings and has a, a close connection to our community. Matt Francois, city council member, welcome. What, what's going on in the city? Good morning, President Walker and members of the board. Thank you for having us as always. It's nice to see you all, uh, virtually at least, and hope everyone is uh, happy and healthy and safe. Uh, at the city, we've resumed our, our city council meetings after a break in August, so we're back to business. We had a council meeting on uh, the 21st of September, where we received a quarterly update from staff on the five priorities the council had set for the next two years. And to remind the board, those priorities, and I'll take them in order, are diversity, equity, and inclusion. On that priority, we have training for staff, uh, commissioners and council uh, coming up this fall and into next year. We formed a community-based task force that will provide uh, recommendations and input to the council. The mayor, Kevin Wilk, I'm the vice mayor, and I both serve on that as uh, council representatives to that community-based task force. And early next year, you'll be should be watching your email inboxes and other forms of communication for a community survey regarding uh, how we can become a more diverse and inclusive community. Our second priority is economic development and COVID recovery. Uh, much to most residents' uh, pleasure, the outdoor dining program will continue at least through the end of this year. And the council would like it to continue in some form going forward. So we'll be having further discussions on that. We also realize we need to do a better job streamlining the permit processing for homeowners looking to do a bathroom remodel or for businesses downtown looking to do tenant improvements so that we can fill some of those vacant space, vacant store spaces downtown. So that's a priority as well. We Coming up on our agenda on October 5th, We'll be having a discussion about uh, the future of cannabis in Walnut Creek and the regulations concerning that. So for any members of the Rossmore community that are interested in that topic, I encourage you to participate in our October 4th, uh, sorry, October 5th meeting. Third priority, I'm halfway there, Ec uh, environmental sustainability and climate action plan. That's the plan that the city is adopting so that we're in, in conformance with the statewide greenhouse gas reduction goals. We've done a lot of work already. Next year, we'll actually begin the process of preparing and completing the plan that'll help us achieve um, the state's goals for greenhouse gas reductions. Our fourth priority being infrastructure and facilities. The primary focus there is on, we, we have infrastructure needs generally throughout the town and we try to address those on an ongoing basis, trees and streets and sidewalks. And in terms of the main um, capital facilities, that, that would be in Heather Farm Park and the Clark uh, Swim Center and the community center there. So that our focus is on trying to come up with a plan to rehabilitate and redevelop both those facilities, which are more than 50 years old, and also discuss financing options to do that, which we'll also be doing in our October 5th meeting and continuing on through the fall. And rounding out our priorities, our fifth priority, social wellness and public safety. As I believe I've reported on before, the, this, our city manager has taken a leadership role on um, mental health crisis response and training. 
and has worked with the county and other city managers to come up with a pilot program. Again, at the, it'll be administered at a county level uh, whereby there can be a 24 seven non-police response if warranted to those uh, in a mental health crisis. We've also, our p police department has entered into a mutual aid agreement with other police departments in the area to ensure that if a police presence is needed at one of those calls, the officers that will respond will have specialized training to deal with those um, suffering from mental health issues. And we're also focused on enhancing community engagement. So that was, sorry for throwing all that information at you, but those are our five priorities. We just received a quarterly update. So that's fresh off the presses. And I just had two other quick updates for you. I serve on the uh, legislation committee again, along with um, Mayor Wilk. And as you may know, the governor signed a series of housing bills recently. One of those bills, SB9, would allow um, single family lots to be split and for uh, duplexes to be constructed on, on each of those lots. It's probably less of a concern for Rossmore, but just so that you and the rest of the members of the community know the city took a formal opposed position on that bill. We didn't think that that was the right uh, type of solution to the housing crisis. Uh, we got overridden by higher powers, but that, that was the city's official position was an opposed position on SB9. And finally, I wanted to make sure that uh, Rossmore residents knew that October 9th, uh, Community Service Day is happening in the city again. If you go on the city's website, walnut-creek.org, there's a big banner right there. There's still opportunities to sign up for volunteer opportunities. I just signed up to help with landscaping at uh, Heather Farm Park. So if you're available and willing to help out on October 9th, please do sign up and I'd be happy to answer any questions. All right, any questions for Matt? Carl? Yes, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, the city of Walnut Creek, uh, we heard that the city of Walnut Creek was gonna work with Caltrans to fix the problem of the 680 Olympic uh, intersection where traffic uh, to avoid congestion is getting off, northbound traffic is getting off and then back on again, causing tremendous backups at uh, Olympic on Olympic, sometimes to the point that it actually obstructs traffic trying to get off southbound from 680. And they were going to approach Caltrans and make it required that you either make a left or right turn when you exit off of Olympic However, it's been a couple of years and nothing has changed. How would I find out uh, what's being done about that? No, I, I'm happy to follow up with um, our traffic engineer, uh, Smidar Boardman, and, and follow up with you offline on, on that if you like and see if I can get any <laughs> further information. Thank you. Okay, uh, Dale. Uh, yes, um, Mr. Francois. Um, the governor a few days ago um, signed an extension, a, a bill that extends the ability for public agencies to continue meeting virtually. Um, will the city be uh, following up on that with any of your committees or uh, even the council? Yeah, th thanks for that question, um, Dale. The we, the council uh, beginning in June started, resumed meeting in person. We're uh, in accordance with the county uh, health guidance. We're all wearing masks as is everybody who enters the city hall building. So members of the public though, are able to come to city hall and participate that way if they're masked or the option. And I believe this option will remain for some time to come is that they can participate by zoom. And so um, certainly that that is in place now. And I, I foresee that will be in place possibly on a permanent basis going forward. Our commissions, the design review commission, the planning commission, they're all still be, uh, meeting virtually. 
and I believe they will do so at least through the, the end of this year. Thank you. We have certainly experienced a, a larger number of residents participating in meetings here because of the virtual uh, option. So that, that's good to hear. Thank you very much. Hey, Matt, just to follow up on that, do you find any problems with uh, people being able to understand masked participants in the meeting? Because I assume you know, we have, remain masked. Yeah, we haven't had that issue. We At the dais, we have microphones right in front of us. We have had, we have a video technician who runs the meetings and he'll, he ought, sometimes will tell some a member of the public or a staff, please speak right into the microphone, but it hasn't been an issue if that happens. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for Matt? Matt, thank you very much. We always appreciate you being here. You bet, have a nice weekend. All right, thank you. Uh, next up, a financial status report. Uh, Joel Lesser, good morning. Yes, good morning. Yeah, I think Mary's going to go over the financial status report and then I'll make some comments. Oh, okay. Thank you. Mary? Thank you. Uh, thank you, President Walker. Continuing the positive trend for 2021, revenue was over budget by $490,000 through the end of August. The major contributor continued to be the favorable golf revenue at $327,000, followed by personal training revenue of $61,000. As well, total expenses were continuing to be under budget by 252000 mainly because of unfilled positions. There's a net positive variance for revenue and expenses of 742000 through the end of August. For MOD, revenue was under budget by 94000 and the major contributor is still the unfavorable variance because of a lack of building maintenance activity. However, total expenses were also under budget by 454,000. Compensation costs related to building maintenance is the major reason. Year to date, revenue of 7,044,000 000 exceeded expenses of 6,819,000, excuse me, 6,619,000 by a total of 425,000. And now Joel, if you could tell us about trust fund activity and more details. Thank you. Okay, yeah, you did a very thorough job with the financials. Probably the only thing I have to add there is, uh, you know, water uh, continues to be over budget uh, on a year to date basis. It is over budget by uh, $185,000. Uh, however, uh, uh, some good news for the month in that we were under budget by, uh, I believe it was, uh, just under $8,000. So uh, at least the trend is good. I got an indication uh, from uh, the golf department that the water usage uh, from mid-August to mid-September is actually lower than expected. So that uh, that's very good news. And uh, that is all. Okay. Thank you, Joel. And Mary, any questions for Joel or Mary? Uh, seeing none, move on. Uh, Tim, the CEO report. Good morning. All right. Good morning, everybody. So let me just uh, comment on the financial report there, in particular water for just a moment. Uh, Mark Heptig, the director of golf, has uh, commented at the golf advisory committee meetings, and then he also discussed this at the budget meeting earlier this month that we turn the water on, the water valve for East Bay Mud at the earliest it's ever been turned on. Mark's been here, I think, 26 years never heard had the valve turned on as early as it was. I think it was in February or the end of January of this year. So water, you know, that's why it's over budget uh, year to date. And that's why it's under budget for the month is that we're, we're, we're back on track with the normal usage that we expect at this time of the year. But the, you know, February, March, April, and May window, which is when we normally use little, if any water, in fact, there was even a year, a couple of years back where we didn't turn the valve on until June. So just to give you an idea. So uh, water will be an issue. Uh, you know, it's a scarcity and, um, and we're in the midst of a drought. And if we don't get much rain this year, 
we can expect to probably face similar conditions next year, but probably with the imposition of uh, drought measures by either the state or the water district. All right, so that's uh, just a, a comment on the financials. So let me uh, get into my report here. First, I'm going to talk about is the pandemic as it relates to Rossmore. So, uh, the C so I'm going to give you some numbers. The CDC, and I just checked these numbers this morning, uh, the CDC has announced that 55% of Americans as of today are fully vaccinated. So that includes everyone, including children, which are not yet eligible for vaccination. So a 55% is the U.S. figure. For the county, it's 81%. It's, um, and that's also verified as of this morning. And that's people over the age of 12. So 81% of county residents over the age of 12 are fully vaccinated now. In our zip code, uh, which is made up mostly of Rossmore, but there are some homes outside of Rossmore, about 7,000 homes outside Rossmore. 90% of residents in our zip code over the age of 12 are fully vaccinated. And I also wanted to comment on Golden Rain staff. The staff vaccination rate is nearly identical. We're at 89.4%, so almost identical to what the uh, zip code uh, vaccination rate is. And I will uh, comment, if you look at the trend charts on the county's website, on the health services website, you can see that both the infection and death rates in Contra Costa County have been in a steady decline since mid-August. So. Um, that's cautious good news. Hopefully that trend continues. Also on the County Health Services website, they indicate that 95.4% of all the deaths in the county since December 15th have been to persons who are unvaccinated. And the reason December 15th is the date that they uh, have put the measurement out is because that was the date that the vaccines were first available here in Contra Costa. So again, 95%, nearly all the deaths in the county since December 15th have been to, to those who are unvaccinated. County also has information on their site that says that, uh, and this number changes every single day, the infection rate for unvaccinated people is more than four times greater than it is for vaccinated persons. And, and that data, also I verified that this morning. So um, I, I guess the takeaway from that is that uh, if you're unvaccinated, it's very, very risky, and you have a, a much greater chance of dying um, based on the data. Um, for those that are vaccinated, it still indicates that you can get the, vi the virus. The vaccines do not prevent people from getting the virus. So I think they, or according to the county and the health officials, they, uh, the vaccinations are highly effective at preventing serious illness, hospitalization, and death. So if you know people, uh, friends, family members, and in particular caregivers or those that are coming to your home for any reason to do repair work or whatever. And if you ask them if they are vaccinated and they are not, please encourage them to get vaccinated. And of course, you want to take precautions if you're allowing people in your home vaccinated or not. So um, when you look at the data now for uh, these last couple of months since the spike occurred, and the spike that occurred in July and August appears to have spiked because of the state and the country opening most things up effective on June 15th. And so you would expect then with all of a sudden the valve, the spigot opening wide um, with everybody doing everything that they wanted to do, um, basically reverting back to pre-pandemic standards on June 15th, you would expect then to likely see a spike in infections in, in the following weeks, which is exactly what's happened. So um, even though the numbers right now are looking very encouraging, it's been in a steady decline pretty much since the peak in mid-August, uh, um, neither the president or the governor are ready to declare victory on, on over COVID yet. So um, stay tuned to that. The, uh, the update on the health order is that effective on September 22nd, so just over a week ago, the new health order requires that all indoor patrons of gyms and restaurants have to wear masks. So uh, that would include the Creekside Grill and it would include the Tice Creek Gym, our fitness facility. So if you are using those facilities indoors, you must be masked. Uh, obviously there's an outdoor facility at Creekside. So if you're sitting outdoors, you are not required to be masked just if you're indoors. But, you know, I think it's still good 
um, practice and, and advice to continue wear your mask, even if you're outdoors at Creekside Grill, if you're not eating. So if you're just conversing to be safe, keep your mask on. Um, so you, um, and then when you're indoors, you can remove the mask when you're eating and drinking, but you might, you're required to put it back on as soon as you finish eating and drinking. So the health officials continue to remind us to, to remain vigilant, not let our guard down and keep using our common sense precautions that we've been living with now for the last year and a half, which is masking, social distancing and sanitizing. Now, my next item here is uh, something the board's already aware of, but I'm, I'm really sharing this for the benefit of the community and those that either didn't follow the, the board's actions last month or our announcement that we uh, have publicized now for the last uh, uh, week, week or a couple of weeks now, I guess. And that is that <clears throat> last August 26th, the uh, Golden Rain Board met in executive session and we consulted with our legal counsel and senior staff and the board decided to require that all unvaccinated staff either become vaccinated or submit weekly negative test results. And that um, became effective this week. So the board made that decision on August 26th. We had to roll it out in terms of the finding testing facilities that, that we would accept their testing results and, and work out a way for payment if payment is required. So that had to take place. So we made that announcement to the staff on September 7th and gave them notice. And so that went into effect on September 27th. So every employee who came to work that was unvaccinated this past Monday had to provide either evidence of, of being fully vaccinated or show a negative test result in the previous 72 hours. So, um, and that will now be a weekly requirement. So all unvaccinated staff now are required to submit that paperwork every single Monday. Um, we've, and the reason I'm talking about this now, even though we, the board dealt with this last month, although it was an executive session, so the community didn't see or hear all the deliberations around this, but the board felt that the reason that they implemented this is that 100% of the residents in Rossmore are in fit the high risk category. So, you know, obviously everybody here in Rossmore is over the age of 55 and, and the, the really critical age group is anybody over the age of 65. But um, uh, so the board felt that now with uh, all the residents at risk and more than enough time now, eight months for people to get vaccinated and the proliferation of the vaccines at even at the grocery store, um, makes it a lot easier to access. And that was not the case, as you remember, back in January, February, March, April, when the vaccine was pretty hard to come by. So we, we continue to receive a lot of comments from residents. And, and again, this is why I wanted to re-explain this and make sure people understand why the board took the action that it did. <clears throat> and so we all know, and we've read and heard in the news, the newspaper, that numerous government, government employers city and county of San Francisco, um, other counties here in the Bay Area, but San Francisco is the first. Um, and and we are increasingly reading about private employers who have been implementing this same standard over the last month. Um, but residents have been critical of this. There have been a number of residents who continue. In fact, even yesterday, I think I got two or three new uh, inquiries or demands and wondering why Golden Rain did not mandate vaccines. And, that was upon the advice of our legal counsel. Uh, the law in California is not clear that private employers can avoid liability for, terminating, for terminating somebody over their vaccination status. So, uh, it, and, and it's expected in the legal profession, they expect that this matter will be ultimately decided by the United States Supreme Court. So the cost to, to take a claim to court or to defend yourself at the Supreme Court level would cost about $2 million and um, give or take you know, a few hundred thousand dollars. So uh, the board did not feel that that would be an appropriate use of, of GRF resources of the coupon monies that, that the residents here pay. So decided that the mandate that they imposed, which was the weekly testing requirement, um, for anybody that's unvaccinated would, would suffice. And you'll see, as I said, many, many employers and various levels of government have already imposed that. Not that many have imposed a mandatory vaccine, uh, vaccination requirement, unless they're mission critical, like, it, like hospitals and, and things like that. Um, there are some federal, state, and local governments who have imposed a mandatory or in the process of imposing a mandatory vaccine requirement. 
But I, it's important that residents understand that public employers, federal, state, and local governments, commissions, public commissions, public agencies, all of them by law are exempt from liability. So if an, empl if an employee was, was to be terminated for not getting a vaccination for, for a public agency or public government, they, the, those governments, unless they agree to be sued, um, are not liable. The courts just throw those kind of lawsuits out. So, uh, but the same uh, exemption from liability does not exist for private employers. So right now, pretty much the only private employers you're hearing about that have imposed mandatory vaccines are the largest and wealthiest and most profitable companies in the United States. So Google, Microsoft, Salesforce, Goldman Sachs, um, you know, Fortune 500 companies, not all of them, actually very few, but they are the ones that you're reading about are those companies that are the very largest that have pretty much unlimited financial resources to be able to defend themselves all the way to the Supreme Court if necessary. Um, I've also had a number of residents asking, actually criticizing the board for, for um, doing a test. Um, and because in the newspaper article, it indicated that Golden Rain would pay for the test and would pay for the time off to take the test. And so that caused a number of residents to be concerned about that and didn't feel that that was appropriate, that, that employees should be, we've had a number of people demanding that employees should be terminated if they are not vaccinated. We've, and so I've just addressed that. But in terms of the testing, California law requires that if, if an employer mandates a medical test, that the employer must pay for the test and must pay, pay for the time off to take the test. That is the law in California. So that is why Golden Rain has to do both. Both if we're going to mandate the, the testing, which is the, the COVID-19 test, then we also have to provide time for the employee, paid time off for the employee to take the test. So, um, so that's all, all of this the board was considering when they did discuss this back on August 26th. And um, let's see. Uh, so the next issue that a number of residents have commented on is that they are demanding to know the medical status of our staff. And by law, California or Golden Rain in, in California cannot share with residents the health status of any employee. Now, if you are, say, a user of the fitness center or any uh, coming into any of our facilities, you can ask an employee that question. And if they volunteer it, they can provide that. But they are not under legal obligation or our policy obligation to disclose that. It would be, it would be against the law for Golden Rain to mandate that an employee disclose their health status. So uh, if an employee volunteers it, they can do that. So you are welcome and free to ask an employee if they are. They are not required to answer the question. So in that case, I would continue to uh, emphasize to any resident or any person or visitor that's coming into contact with a staff member or anybody else, whether it's the contractor or a caregiver or anybody else that you're interacting with, that you ask them their status. And if uh, they don't choose to answer the question, that you just ensure that you're going to take good, safe precautions, both in keeping distance and sanitizing any surfaces that, are, that you're sharing and in making sure that they and you are wearing a mask while they're in, either in your home or while you're visiting one of our facilities where you're coming into contact with somebody. I want to also reemphasize that I said at the top of my report that nearly nine out of 10 GRF employees are vaccinated. That's just about uh, the same ratio as the rest of the Rossmore community. Uh, and we've also had a number of our employees who are not fully vaccinated, but they have had at least one shot. So it, the, the actual number I would expect to see change in two weeks to at least about 92% of our staff, which will be even a higher number than than the zip code here in Rossmore. But I, I also want to remind everybody that all of our staff provide a valuable service to the Rossmore community. And that those employees that for whatever reason, whether it's religious or health or personal reasons, if they've decided not to be vaccinated, that's their decision. Uh, we are strongly recommending that all staff, all visitors, all caregivers, all contractors are vaccinated. We can't require that, but we are strongly recommending it. Uh, but we, because we do have a uh, a small handful of, of staff members who are unvaccinated, it, and it affects numerous departments. It, it's going to make um, 
possibly present some issues with our both our efficiency and our productivity. So to have staff members leave work to go be tested, and they're gone for an hour or two and then come back, you know, obviously that's lost work time. Uh, and, and you multiply that by a couple dozen people who are unvaccinated, and that time adds up, and it, and it, it will have an impact on both our efficiency, maybe our response times or our delivery times. So the board heard all of that uh, in the deliberations last month, and um, they felt that uh, the safety of the community was more important. So uh, we will get through this and just ask that people have patience. I know that it's frustrating for those that are vaccinated and um, it's difficult, I think, to understand why uh, either residents or staff members are not vaccinated. Uh, but fortunately, the numbers are very, very low in terms of the number that are unvaccinated here in the community, both on staff and in, in the residents' uh, homes here. And the health officials continue to tell us that uh, if you're vaccinated, your chance of acquiring the virus or being seriously ill from the virus is very, very remote. Um, the other thing I, I just want to remind, and I said this many, many times over the last year and a half, and that is that the just coming into contact with somebody, the public health officials say, this is not me talking, this is what the public health officials are saying, is that a very, like a chance encounter or a very brief encounter with an infected person, if you're vaccinated, is likely not going to affect you, even if you're unvaccinated and you're coming into contact with an unvaccinated infected person. A brief encounter, generally, they don't believe, is going to affect your um, your ability to get the, the virus. And so what they keep talking about is something called the viral load, and it's how much of the virus is in that person when they exhale. And if you're talking to somebody very closely for a long period of time, your exposure to the viral load is obviously much greater and you have a much greater chance of, of getting the virus. But if it's a brief encounter, whether it's indoors or outdoors, the health officials at every level, at the federal, at the CDC, at the California Department of Public Health, which is the state health department, or even here in our county, which is Contra Costa Health Services, they've all indicated that a, a brief exposure is likely not going to cause an infection. So, um, Again, and I've, I think I've published this before, but I updated the numbers because the, the CDC has updated the numbers uh, just last week. And that is that your risk of dying, if you are vaccinated, your risk of dying from the seasonal flu is 0.1%, which is 59 times greater than a vaccinated person dying of COVID-19. So um, again, if you're vaccinated, you, are, you have really strong protection. And uh, I would just encourage you to continue to follow the recommendations of the public health officials. And I think that they're about ready to roll out and they've already rolled out the Pfizer vaccine for boosters. So if you are eligible, I would encourage you to get a booster. Um, but again, I'm not a health professional. So follow the recommendations of your health professional and the public health officials. Uh, my next item I wanted to talk about is pickleball expansion. So. <clears throat> this has been a hot button topic. I know that that's, I'm sure, why a number of people are here uh, uh, attending as participants here in today's meeting, and I'm sure we're going to hear from a number of them in a few minutes during resident forum. And so let me just give a little uh, background to where we're at with pickleball. Um, uh, just about a year ago, the um, pickleball club presented a white paper to GRF that explained why they felt there was a need to um, uh, improve the Creekside courts and not just improve them, but resurface them and expand them to include additional courts. And uh, this goes back to even to prior to my time here, uh, which was in late 2015. Uh, the issue of pickleball was an issue back then. There were no outdoor pickleball courts back then. There were three indoor courts at the, at the uh, old Devalier gym. And um, then when we renovated the gym in 2018, we had to shrink you know in order to accommodate all the other needs in the building we had to shrink the size of the uh, area on the courts dedicated to pickleball so that was reduced from three courts indoor courts to two but at the same time golden rain or i should say just a few months prior to opening the the uh, fitness the new fitness facility golden rain authorized uh um not a resurfacing, but some repairs that were done to the Creekside courts, outdoor tennis courts, and converting them 
uh, for pickleball use. And so we were able to convert three, uh, a two, two of those tennis courts into three pickleball courts. And the reason we weren't able to put more courts there is just was the, the erosion caused by the creek has, had caused significant cracking. We repaired those cracks at that time. So that goes back to 2017, that's four years ago. Um, but since then, the creek continues to move and uh, the cracks have reappeared, they've gotten worse. And so it became time a year ago for the, for the club to make a formal request of the Golden Rain Board to do something with, um, with pickleball. So prior to the white paper being issued a year ago, the, um, the Golden Rain had requested that the pickleball club coordinate with the tennis club and see if there was a way to share the Buckeye tennis courts with pickleball. So the pickleball club for many months had uh, explored that option with the tennis club and uh, it wasn't going to be feasible. The tennis club was not willing to give up their courts for pickleball. And while the two games are similar in terms of how the courts are laid out, um, they, the tennis court felt, the tennis club felt that they needed to have all of their tennis courts available for tennis exclusively. So then the pickleball club then requested that uh, Golden Rain consider the expansion of, of the Creekside courts. In January, the board agreed and authorized spending money to do that. So when that happened, uh, after we hired the contractor and they did some sample testing of the soil uh, um, at the, uh, underneath the surface there, they, they learned that the, the erosion will continue, that, that spending a whole bunch of money on an upgraded pickleball complex at Creekside was not gonna be feasible without significant um, shoring up of the surface underneath the, play, the playing area, uh, which would require a, a very extensive and very expensive expansion of the subsurface support to prevent the, the creek from continuing to erode the, the actual playing surface. So when that happened, then you know, I think that was in January, then the Golden Rain Board uh, kind of went back to the drawing table to look at other options. And so the, the only other flat area that is conducive to pickleball was the area to the east of the Dollar Clubhouse. Now, <laughs> I, I've seen some comments from some residents who've been criticizing me for calling it the area east of the clubhouse. But that is because most residents do not use the Dollar Clubhouse and they don't know what area we're even talking about. So um, that is why I've described it as the area east of the clubhouse. It is the park area, the grassy area uh, to the east as you head towards um, uh, Rossmore Parkway on that side. Not the other side, not the back side, which is uh, butts up to the, uh, I think it's the 17th uh, green. We're not talking about that area at this time. <clears throat> so that was what the board um, wanted to explore and they authorized a consultant to evaluate whether it would be even feasible to put uh, pickleball courts in that area and still retain its character and still retain uh, the outdoor uh, stage, staging area for concerts and the like. It, it, none of this area that we're talking about is, is part of the historical designation of the Dollar House. We've had a lot of correspondence from residents who've insisted that it is, it is not. We've looked at the actual designations from the state and federal agencies. So it is not part of the historical designation, but it certainly is part of the character of the dollar facility and the grounds around it. So, um, so it, it's being evaluated just because it's another one of the options. We've had a number of people, quite a few people recommend Hillside and the Lawn Bowling Greens as other flat areas. The Lawn Bowling Green, obviously, you know, if you take over one amenity uh, from one club and give it to another club, that's gonna be controversial. There's a very active lawn bowling club here. It is one of the very first amenities here. It's even called out for in the trust agreement. So, um, so taking the lawn bowling course uh, greens away from the lawn bowling club, even one of them to build, uh, you know, whatever, three, four, five courts or whatever could fit on one green um, would seriously impact that club. So that and pickleball and lawn bowling are really not compatible sports to have next to each other. Lawn bowling is a, is a very quiet sport. Pickleball is not. Then we looked also looked at the hillside, uh, the Sportsman's Park area, 
and which is kind of flat where the bocce courts are. Now, bocce potentially could move to another location. Even a, a space next to dollar might not be an incompatible use of that space. Lawn, uh, bocce is a quiet sport. But the area up at Sportsman's Park, um, really not very conducive to putting pickleball. It would take up virtually the entire space to put eight courts up there. But the bigger problem is that there are homes directly above that area. And you, unless you enclose pickleball with a roof, the sound is going to travel up. You can mask it for the sound traveling out to the sides by putting up um, a, a product called Acoustifence. But the roof, um, very, very expensive to put an enclosure, a fully enclosed pickleball complex there. And the homes directly above that would not uh, be supportive of that. So that isn't an option either. So we're really, the only spaces that are really compatible uh, for pickleball are the Buckeye tennis courts, the dollar uh, park area, the area east of the clubhouse, and the Creekside area. And as I had mentioned earlier, the Creekside area would require some significant additional work. None of these are going to be inexpensive. Every one of these options is going to be probably about the same amount of money. So uh, that's what's being evaluated right now. Now, we're not discussing that here today during the board meeting, but because a number of residents have, have written to the board and demanded that board members that are members of the, of the pickleball club recuse themselves from voting. And so that issue will be discussed today during the later part of the agenda. So uh, I'm sure we'll hear from a number of residents on that topic. So a recusal on the pickleball issue is going to be on the board agenda here for later today. Um, so, and then finally, the board did hire the consultant, and we are expecting to get the consultant's report at the planning committee meeting on October 14th. So I would encourage everybody who has an interest in this to attend the planning committee meeting on the 14th and, and hear what the, whether, the even, whether pickleball is even feasible at that location or not. Uh, and I should say that even if it is determined to be feasible, it does not necessarily mean that that's where the pickleball complex will be going, but it, it's part of what the board needed to evaluate to consider all the options. I also wanted to talk about the solar, uh, to clarify Golden Rain's position on solar. So um, last month, the board heard from the consultant that Golden Rain hired, uh, Bill Golov, to evaluate the Rossmore Sustainability, or I should say the Rossmore Solar Initiative that was proposed by the Sustainable Rossmore Club. And um, this has been somewhat controversial uh, and residents have continued to write to me and to the board demanding to know why Golden Rain has any interest whatsoever in whether a mutual installs solar. So to be clear, Golden Rain Foundation has no interest in whether or not a mutual puts solar. Uh, Golden Rain has determined for itself that solar makes sense. Obviously, there's a, a great big one megawatt facility on the hillside up there by MOD. And the Golden Rain Board a few months back has already approved a phase two project that will have solar over the parking lot at uh, Dollar and the parking lot at Gateway. And that project is under development right now. Uh, so for Golden Rain, in the analysis that, that Golden Rain has conducted over the last several years, solar makes sense. It will save this community many millions of dollars over the 25-year life of the solar installation. So Golden Rain supports sustainability for, you know, with solar and a number of other initiatives, including the Recycling Center up near MOD. But solar may not be economical or feasible for the homeowners associations here, which are the mutuals. And, and, but that's not for Golden Rain to decide. That's for the mutuals to decide. So, so GRF, again, has no opinion as to whether or not solar is appropriate for a mutual. But that's not what the, what the Rossmore Solar Initiative was. The RSI was an initiative not for an individual HOA or mutual to decide whether solar is right for them. It was a complete transformation of the, solar, of the uh, energy um, uh, um, delivery, uh, the, the entire delivery system for energy here in Rossmore. And, and it was a, a, a concept that spanned all of the mutuals, which is what it was originally proposed for. And so Golden Rain's advice to the mutuals who have asked has been to proceed slowly, evaluate this, hire an independent consultant to evaluate whether this makes sense for them in the mutual or not. 
and um, and make sure that all of the legal, financial, operational, and aesthetic issues are addressed, and then to be completely transparent with full disclosure to the residents. And, and that has been GRF's position on the Rossmore Sustainability Initiative. But the mutuals, as it turns out, were uh, have been a little reluctant to expend funds on hiring an analyst to analyze this, and, um, and nor were any of the mutuals prepared to evaluate whether a, the, this proposal um, was appropriate for uh, spanning multiple, multiple mutuals. It was beyond their scope to evaluate. So we've had uh, quite a few directors and mutual boards ask Golden Rain to uh, help evaluate this because it, it is not just for an individual mutual, it was for all of the community. So that's why Golden Rain hired uh, Bill Golov, who is our longtime solar consultant. He's helped us with both our phase one and our phase two evaluations. And um, he doesn't sell solar systems. He just helps companies and, and, and businesses and public agencies evaluate whether solar is appropriate for them or not. So he agreed to evaluate the RSI and help to formulate the questions that MOD could provide to the mutuals to help them evaluate whether solar, the RSI being proposed under the, I'm sorry, the solar being proposed under the RSI was appropriate for the, the respective mutuals. So what Mr. Golov had, had pointed out to the board last month was that as the RSI, uh, as the way it was laid out, by Sustainable Rossmore is that there were a lot of issues with it. It was not economically or practically feasible, according to Mr. Golov, that the financial representations made in the RSI were not supported. He explicit, explicitly stated that even if there was adequate available rooftop space, which he said was evaluated several years back, I think seven or eight years ago, all of Rossmore was evaluated whether or not solar would be feasible on the roofs there. But he said, even if it was, and it wasn't, but even if it was, it would be impossible to generate RSI's proposed $100 million in savings, install EV charging, electric vehicle charging stations, replace the uh, outdated wiring infrastructure in the mutuals, and install batteries and microgrids with no upfront cost to the residents. That was the proposal. And so he said there's just physic there's just no way that for that to happen. And he also identified the impracticality and questionable legal and regulatory hurdles that he felt were would be extremely difficult, if not impossible, to overcome to design a multi-mutual energy management and billing entity to replace PG e and MCE given the limitations in the CCNRs of the mutuals. So um, so that's why Golden Rain evaluated this. That's why Mr. Golov uh, gave his uh, opinions to the board last month, and then the questions were developed and given to the mutuals. And so the mutuals now have the questions that they can ask of the Rossmore uh, Solar Initiative and see whether or not that, that initiative makes sense. And I saw in the paper yesterday that it looks like a sustainable Rossmore is is, is um, scaling back their proposal. I'm not sure what their current model is. It looks like they're interested in, in helping mutuals determine whether or not solar is good for them independently of a larger initiative uh, with a, uh, under the Rossmore um, Solar Initiative. So um, again, I'm not sure exactly what their new initiative is, but it looks like they've scaled it back somewhat. But if the RSI is still of interest by either a mutual or sustainable Rossmore, at least now there are some tools to evaluate that and ask independent questions as to whether or not it's a, an appropriate um, uh, facility, solar facility for a given mutual. My last item I'm gonna cover is employee transitions. We had one employee begin their employment with Golden Rain. Um, her name is Megan McCann. She works as, as an accountant up in the accounting department. But we had six employees leave Golden Rain in August. Unfortunately, it's um, become, it's just the lay of the land now uh, everywhere. It's, there's a lot of uh, jobs out there and people can find other opportunities that might pay, pay more, be closer to home. And I think that's what's happened with a number of these employees. So. In August, we lost Jairo Aguilar. He was an, account, uh, an accounts payable specialist in the accounting department. Christine Conti, she was a uh, the H Homeowner Association Mutual Portfolio Coordinator in the, in the board office for the mutuals. Paulette Creel was a fitness trainer at the fitness center. Rigoberto Limas, he was a custodian with the uh, custodial department. John McPartland was, was our long-term pest control technician. He's left. 
in our landscape department, and Mark Pulliam, also our longtime uh, accountant, uh, retired. So that's my report for this month. Thank you, Tim. Before we get to questions, <clears throat> I'd just like to note on a personal note to drive home the importance of vaccinations. Um, my otherwise healthy sister, 77 years old, who made a conscious decision not to vaccinate, contracted COVID a month ago and passed away last night. It is a live threat to everybody. Uh, and so get vaccinated if you're not. Dwight, I'm very sorry for your loss. Oh, thank you. Any questions for Tim? All right, uh, moving on, we are into the residence forum. Uh, before we go there, I have a couple comments I'd like to make. You know, there are numerous volunteers on GRF committees and the board who dedicate countless hours and hard work on behalf of the residents of Rossmore. I, kn I know I can speak for all of us that we aim to treat all residents with respect. We also strive to operate with integrity and transparency. Please recognize that as volunteers, we are your neighbors and only want to do what is best to serve this terrific community. Everyone needs to conduct themselves with trust, respect, and courtesy. And with that, uh, we have over 30 um, uh, participants who would like to uh, speak today uh, out of 144 attendees. So welcome everybody. Uh, we will just as a housekeeping item in about a half an hour, take a five minute break because um, if everybody wants to speak, we're going to be here a long time, but we do wanna hear everybody. So with that, uh, Lisa, I believe you're uh, coordinating today for Residence Forum. I sure am, Dwight. Thank you. I sure am, Dwight. Um, just Okay, um, here we go. Residents have up to three minutes to address the board. The board does not directly answer questions posed by speakers during the residence forum, but it does hear the viewpoints and ideas presented, and directors do consider them as they act during the meeting. If you wish to address the board, use the raise hand feature or press star nine if connecting via phone audio only. Residents are welcome to type their comment in the Q&A chat feature located in the, on the control panel of Zoom at the start of the meeting and up until the start of the residence forum. Please wait your turn and once unmuted, state your full name and Rossmore address. Once the residence forum has begun, additional resident comments will not be considered. Okay, our first speaker in the forum is um, Annette Fairbanks. Annette, uh, please uh, go ahead and unmute yourself and uh, please state your name and Rossmore address for the record. And then you may have three minutes to address the, the board. Hello, I am Annette Fairbanks, 2301 Tice Creek Drive, number six. I've been a resident for over six years. And I do appreciate all the volunteers that we have throughout our entire Rossmore family. I know residents uh, use different facilities. And um, to me, the area around the dollar uh, house has been a refuge, peace and quiet, a nice place to take a visitor for an afternoon. Now, I believe pickleball is an important sport, but I don't believe it should replace greenery and trees that cannot be replaced. So let us look for a suitable area, even if it is a little more expensive, to have your sport. And I would request that members of the GRF board who are pickle board enthusiasts ex recluse, rec recuse themselves, I think is proper, recuse themselves at this time from further deliberations of that location. It is important for your uh, participation, of course, but when it comes to voting, I don't think you should have a voice that is very clearly a uh, conflict of interests. So please consider my request to recuse yourself 
and also to do a thorough explanation where a good pickleboard court can be uh, included in the Rossmore amenities. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Annette. Our next uh, speaker is Ben Bernstein. Uh, ben, I'm allowing you to unmute yourself. Please state your full name and Rossmore address. Lisa, let's move on to the next speaker. Yes. Um, okay. Um, the next speaker is Carol Sirioni. Uh, Carol, I'm allowing you to unmute yourself. Uh, please state your full name and Rossmore address, and you may have three minutes to address the board. Carol, are you there? Okay, next is uh, Frank Reynolds. Frank, uh, please state your full name and Rossmore address. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Hi, my name is Frank Reynolds. I live at 4012 Terra Granada Drive, number one. I am the current president of the Rossmore Pickleball Club. At the current time, our club membership stands at 514 members. When the Rossmore Pickleball Club first formed, we played on three courts inside the fitness center. Those three courts were shared with basketball and several other activities. When the fitness center closed, GRF staff worked to fix up old tennis courts at Creekside and mark them for three pickleball courts. When the fitness center reopened, we now shared two courts within the fitness center. Today we play, we continue to play at Creekside and the many widening cracks in that area are continually uh, involved in our play. Around this time, a pickleball facilities committee was formed to find a permanent home in Rossmore that would accommodate eight courts with bathrooms, drinkable water and a gathering area, similar to what the tennis club has. The first request made was for an in indoor facility with amenities. We were told that this was not possible that due to cost. Over the next year and a half, the committee developed a 40 page white paper, which was given to the GRF board members and appropriate committees. The paper include all the research done in three possible locations in Rossmore for a pickleball facility. Those locations were the Buckeye tennis courts. Eight pickleball courts could be constructed on two tennis courts using the existing footprint. Cor uh, Creekside courts, courts could be rotated and seven courts could fit on that footprint. This spot would cost more, had no bathroom or drinkable water. The lawn bowling greens. Uh, at one point, lawn bowling was thinking of converting their grass courts to artificial material, thus needing only two greens from then on. However, the conversion never took place. As a result of the white paper, the planning committee and GR staff allocated 300,000 into looking into pickleball at Creekside. Over the next several months, about 30,000 was spent on civil engineers, soils engineers, landscape architects, and a sound study. The report indicated that a more accurate cost for them was around 775,000. The finance committee said that funds were available to cover that, that, that cost. At the planning committee meeting, GRS staff said the grass area next to the dollar house should be looked at as a possible spot for pickleball. Staff allocated 50,000 to do a feasibility study in that area. Uh, the study was to include a possible amphitheater and improved picnic areas. I tell this story for one reason, and I want the GRF board to know, as well as any committee involved, pickleball is location neutral. Sure, we have our thoughts about what would be best for the club, but the important thing is we just want a place to call our own and play the sport we love. I hope that when the feasibility study is submitted, discussion can now Ten turn seconds. from searching for a new area to the three areas we mentioned. It's our feeling that pickleball is time to make a decision on pickleball is where it's gonna grow and live in Rossmore. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Our next resident forum speaker is Holly. Holly, please state your full name and Rossmore address for the record. And you may have three minutes to address the board. Okay, thank you. My name is Holly. Well, everybody knows me as Holly and I'm so used to it that 
I myself forget my real name, Hung Yu Lang. I live at 1549 Oakmont Drive, entry 12. Um, I chose this name because I want my golden years to be jolly. I'm a, a restless person all my life. I hike, bike, jog, swim, skate, and travel the world. I would have um, never considered living in a retirement community like Rossmore before, because in my mind, the Rossmore people are old. They are inactive and living quietly till the end. Um, thanks to a friend who told me how wrong I was. Uh, and the up-to-date fitness center, tennis courts, golf course, table tennis house, and long bowling field made me believe that not everyone in Rossmore accept their advanced age, especially since pickleball came to the community, a growing number of players have proved that it is an inevitable trend to, for Rossmore to keep up with the rest of the country. I recently visited uh, friends in Minnesota there. I was going to show off how advanced our, our Californians are in pickleball since they playing see, their playing seasons are much shorter than ours. I was surprisingly embarrassed. Their brand new pickleball court, courts are all over the cities and many tennis courts have been converted to pickleball courts too. Their retirement community have many more advanced players than Rossmore. To build an up-to-date pickleball facility in Rossmore is no longer a request from 500 plus members. It's a necessity for the community to meet demand and improve its property value. So I really hope the board consider this building this facility, how important it is. So we want to live, we want to live a happy life, we, you know, golden years. So please, please consider those three um, locations um, for us to live a happy life. Thank you. Thank you, Holly. Our next resident forum speaker is Liz. Please state your name at full name and Rossmore address for the record. There we go. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Ingersoll, 1200 Fairlong Court, apartment two. Uh, short and sweet. I'm not against pickleball. I'm an or pickleball expansion, but I'm very much for trees and tranquility. And I do fear that both will be permanently damaged and lost if the dollar park is used as a site. So thank you for uh, having this forum. It's been really interesting for me. Thank you, Liz. Our next resident forum speaker is uh, Mary Lou Thompson. Mary Lou, go ahead and unmute yourself. Please state your full name and Rossmore address. Mary Lou, it's your turn. Go ahead and state your full name and Rossmore address. We do need you to unmute yourself. Yeah, I think am I I'm, I'm unmuted now. Gotcha. I can hear you. Mm -hmm. Okay, we thank board for examining all aspects of the funding. Uh, we are members are location neutral. On eight level courts plus a bathroom that can accommodate over 500 plus members. And pickleball is an inclusive sport that can accommodate players of all levels and is as inviting for future residents and even tennis players uh, who are beginning to feel the need for something fun and uh, inclusive. And that, Mary Lou, could you state your, your Rossmore address real quick for the record? Yes, 3152 Ptarmigan, number three. Thank you, go ahead. That's it, thank you very much. Thank you, Mary Lou. Our next, Forum speaker is Patty Spinrod. 
Patty, I'm allowing you to unmute yourself. Please state your full name and Rossmore address for the record. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, my name is Patty Spenrod, 2865 Ptarmigan Drive, number one. Um, just to be short to the point, we are the second largest club next to the Democratic Club in Rossmore. Sports clubs much smaller than us have their own facilities. We need a complex that is safe and permanent to accommodate our growing membership. Thank you. Thank you, Patty. Our next speaker is Mimi. Mimi, I'm allowing you to unmute yourself. Please go ahead and state your full name and Rossmore address. Hi, I'm Mimi Amrit and I live at 1232 Skycrest, number six. And I'm new to Rossmore and the first thing I joined was pickleball. And yesterday I happened to see the tennis courts for the first time and I was just blown away at the facility they have compared to what we have. We don't even have a porta potty. I mean, come on. This has to happen fast, not sit around for another year to be discussed. And yes, we're in neutral. And yes, people are going to complain about the noise. It's a happy noise. We're having fun. I mean, I agree with Holly. We have to support life and movement and, you know, community activity for all. It's like, you know, I can hear the freeway in the distance. Well, I doubt they're going to close that down because I don't like it. I mean, it's not a 24 hour noise. It's a happy time and people are enjoying things. So um, I look forward to this going ahead as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Mimi. Our next resident forum speaker is Mary Ann. Uh, Mary Ann Clark, go ahead and state your full name and Rossmore address for the record, please. Hi, I'm Mary Ann Clark, and I live at 1780 Stanley Dollar Drive 2A. Um, I think about the placement of the pickleball courts as well. I'm very concerned about using the Dollar Park for this um, activity. I think the main problem with pickleball that residents have voiced is that the noise is so irritating if you're trying to do something quiet. So um, the pickleball court proposal is to put it on the dollar lawn. There are activities there that are quieter activities. I looked at the tennis court facility at Buckeye the other day, and I thought, wow, this is an amazing space. It's really beautiful. And why can't a pickleball court go up here? Uh, if you were to expend, extend court eight and move out, um, it would be south of that. You could put in, you could build a building. And I think that if we look at anything for the pickleball court, it has to be enclosed because noise is the main issue. We're gonna to have to bite the bullet and spend money. It is a popular sport, but I have to say that um, I belong to the nature walkers and we are um, protecting the space and the dollar for reasons of historic status of the home and grounds. The grounds 10 points out are not historic, but the setting makes it, um, extends the historic value of the property. So if we were to build on it, we would be destroying an ecosystem. We would be destroying trees by putting asphalt and concrete on the tree roots that would kill the trees. Look at the front of dollar, see where the bear is. The bear is a tree that died. That look around the bear. The bear is surrounded by concrete and asphalt. We need to have the pickleball court somewhere where it is contained. And I think that there is space up at Sekai that wouldn't disturb the tennis players. They might have to give up one court, but I think that they could extend it out and it must be enclosed. We have to spend the money to do that because this um, 
controversy is not not going to be over until we give them a place. And I've found that some of the voices today were very adamant that they need to enjoy their sport despite um, they're disturbing other people. I don't think that's right. I think that people have a right to peace and quiet. Meditation takes place at the dollar house. There are clubs, there are activities, weddings, memorials. Things do happen there, despite what Tim said. It's not being used. It's not being used during COVID, but it's used during other times. And Time. we need to protect the value of that historic house. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne. Our next speaker is Shelly Zell. Shelly, uh, go ahead and state your full name and Rossmore address. Uh, good morning. My name is Shelly Zell. I'm at 503 Falconwood. Um, Steve and I moved here in September of 2013. And shortly thereafter, one morning while, um, while exploring the fitness center, I came upon a group of women playing pickleball. Um, they encouraged me to pick up a paddle and join them. And I was immediately hooked on the game. Pickleball, I found, was easy to learn, great exercise, lots of fun. And it's through pick pickleball that over the years I've developed cherished friendships. Um, I had prepared some comments to share um, during this forum, but um, Tim, and that included the history of us trying to get courts, um, but Tim and, and Frank had done such an outstanding job in doing that, that I don't want to take up the time um, saying, saying all that again. So I, I simply will skip to the fact that whether it be during open play or preset times for different levels, weather permitting, the courts are used every day. The indoor courts and the outdoor courts, despite being in such uh, disrepair with cracks and the cracks remaining, we're somehow managing and very carefully um, getting in our, our pickleball games. But we have only three courts outside. It means lots of waiting time. We also have clinics that uh, have generated so much interest. There are waiting lists to participate. Uh, we have social gatherings and we mix in pickleball with multi-level playing. But as others have said, we have no drinkable water, no restrooms. Last night we used the tennis club, uh, the tennis center as a picnic area and we were all just simply in awe saying, why can't we have something like this? Um, I zoomed in on the meeting some time ago that discussed the idea of using two of the eight tennis courts for pickleball. And I know the tennis club was up in arms about this idea but despite the fact with the growing, and that was despite the fact of growing pick, popularity of pickleball, tennis courts across the country are being shared and include pickleball. Your pension plan and 401k plan. Hello? CBiz SLD also. Eric, if you. Hello? Go ahead, Shelly. Somebody oh, wasn't I'm, muted. Okay. Well, I was just saying that, um, that um, even Steve and I have played on tennis courts that have been um, uh, reconfigured and um, up and down the state of California, down in the desert, up in Santa Cruz, up in Oregon, and, um, and it has all worked out fine. And um, I, I hope that the, that the board will Seconds. consider that. I, I just wanna add that I must say it's been very troubling that the process, the long process of finding a site um, um, has created such division. Many of the letters in the Rossmore News, as well as the way in which some have chosen to oppose, to share their to share their oppositions, have been pretty disrespectful, and not at all of what I would expect from our community. Um, I know that the proposals, all the proposals, have inherent um, pros and cons. But I trust that the GRF will make a decision that is respectful of the community in which we all live, fiscally responsible, and will provide a much needed site, a dedicated venue just for pickleball. Um, also, just quickly on the matter of recluso, um, if anyone, that would seem to me that if we do that, it means that anyone considering serving on a board 
would have to be someone who had no ties to any club at Rossmore. Um, and that's ridiculous. I think that we need to trust those who have volunteered and been elected to serve on our pickleball board, that they will act responsibly with the best interest of our community at hand. Thank you. Thank you, Shelley. Our next speaker is Dale Reynolds. Dale, I'm allowing you to unmute yourself. Please go ahead and state your full name and Rossmore address for the record. Can you hear me? We can, Dale. Go right ahead. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, President Walker, members of the board, Mr. O'Keefe and Ms. Deborah, thank you for the time that uh, I have to state my case. My name is Dale Reynolds. I live at 2528 Tarmigan Drive, number four. For full disclosure, I'm a member of the Pickleball Club and past president of the club. So I'm aware of options, of dis opinions of dissent, ascension that can get in the way of progress. The actor Denzel Washington once said, if you read the newspaper, you are misinformed. If you don't read the newspaper, you are uninformed. Here are two examples of the above. Karen Perkins writes, then there is the patio and grassy area that are the backyard of Dollar Clubhouse. They add to the charm and historical value. I agree with her statement, but the fact is the property in question is not part of the historical designation of Dollar House. Ken Anderson writes, what a travesty to the natural tranquility of the unique area to introduce many sharp wax from hitting a plastic ball with a wooden paddle. Fact. Pickleball is not played with a noisy wooden paddle. It's played with state-of-the-art composite materials to make a better paddle and to reduce noise. My wife and I moved to Rossmore in March of 2010. During that time, we were inundated with SOS, Save Our Stanley, which was an objection to building the event center. Later, there were objections and concerns regarding updating the fitness center. Sound familiar from over 10 years ago? Today, people are not demonstrating or creating concerns about decisions made by the GRF board regarding Creekside, the event center, and Tice Fitness Center. Years later, hmm, I can't imagine why. The majority like the results. Here we are in September 2021, and certain people are demonstrating against GRF's suggestion to build an unpublished recommendation to alter the lush greens of the Dollar Picnic area. There's a lot of grass there, which takes a lot of water to keep it green. Where are the climate change warriors? What residents need to fully understand is the Golden Rain Foundation owns all the property, which is not common area. They make certain areas available to residents uh, that, can, that can use their, uh, I'm sorry, available to residents and that they can express their thoughts, concerns or whatever regarding an issue at hand, but they have no control over Golden Rain Foundation. I close with the following quotes. Change is the law of life, and those who look only to the past and the present are certain to miss the future. John F. Kennedy. Change will not come if we wait for some other person or some other time. We are the ones we've been waiting for. We are the change that we seek. Barack Obama. Everyone thinks of changing the world, but no one thinks of changing himself. Leo Tolstoy. Life is never fair, and perhaps it's a good thing for most of us that it's not. Oscar Wilde, thank you for your time and attention. Thank you, Dale. Our next resident forum speaker is Samson Matarasso. I'm allowing you to unmute yourself. Please go ahead and state your full name and Rossmore address for the record, please. Yes, I'm Samson Matarasso. I live at 1537 Canyonwood Court, number two. Um, rather than cover stuff that's been covered, I'd rather talk about, yes, we should have pickleball courts and the question is where. And the first question that comes to my mind, and I don't know all the routines here, but is money, okay? and paying the cost of the renovations and everything. I know there are other activities. I believe one I've been told is the table tennis building where the club itself contributed money toward the construction of their facility. And I would wonder about the use of user fees or 
uh, money or negotiating with the club, which I gather is going to have control of the area once it is built, okay, to contribute um, or promise to contribute so that other areas other than the ones that Mr. O'Keefe mentioned could perhaps be considered because with the additional funding, perhaps land can be renovated and expanded upon. I would also point out that the use, even though expensive, of a bubble over that area um, would allow use the entire day, perhaps into the evening, be climate controlled in our climate changing area here. Um, I would wonder if the tennis club wouldn't have a similar interest, and I'm not sure of those areas, but if somehow it could be combined. Another point that was made here had to do with popularity and how popular it is. Well, in life's progress, okay, new things come and the old things fall behind. Gasoline engines are deferring to electric, okay? Um, I, with all due respect to tradition, I have to go back, of course, to lawn bowling and say, what is the popularity level there? Perhaps the tennis club too, I don't know. And that's where I have to have the concern and respect for all of you because you will be the decision makers here and you are between a rock and a hard place understood. But decisions must be made for progress to take place. Okay, so I hope you would consider that. And of course, a factor there regarding conflict of interest is maybe not by the book there, but the I've heard a lot about outside pressures on the club, okay, in terms of wanting to participate in regional and national tournaments. And that is beautiful if we can actually respond to that. However, that is not the mission of Golden Rain, okay? It is to provide these facilities as needed by our population here. And I wonder- Five seconds. Whether in a club or not, if it's open to everyone and we all pay it something. For. Um, I would also think that at this point, I'm ready to shut up. So thank you very much for your time. <laughs> Thank you, Samson. Uh, our next speaker is, let's see, uh, Mike Dwyer. Mike, I'm allowing you to unmute yourself. Please go ahead and state your full name and Ross Moore address for the record. Uh, Mike Dwyer, did you wish to address the board? Okay. Lisa, I'm going to interrupt for a second. Mm -hmm. I think it's uh, time for a break. Uh, let's break until 1030. So we will return at 1030. Thank you. Okay, it is 10.30, let's uh, reconvene. Lisa, next up. Thank you, Dwight. Our next resident forum speaker is Ed Bell. Ed, would you please state your full name and Rossmore address for the record? Ed Bell, 1817 Skycrest Drive, number six. Um, I'm a recent member of the Pickleball Club. I've been active for about six weeks now. I'm really enjoying Pickleball. Uh, I would like to support the Pickleball Club's uh, desire to have new facilities. However, I'm extremely distressed with the idea of destroying the green area uh, east of the uh, Dollar Clubhouse. I've used that many times uh, uh, and would hate to see that taken away. Uh, I'm hoping that uh, the GRF will consider possibility of other places. A couple of thoughts I have are maybe to take a piece of one of the golf courses and shorten uh, the golf course down to make space that's available. And another alternative, which would probably be more expensive, would be to build a structure over the parking area at Del Valle 
and have the pickleball courts above the parking area, perhaps even solar on top of that. That's all I have to say. Thank you. I appreciate your working on this and uh, wish you well in making a decision. Thank you, Ed. Our next resident forum speaker is Brad Waite. Brad, I'm allowing you to unmute yourself. Please go ahead and state your full name and Rossmore address for the record. Can you hear me, Lisa? Yes, we can, Brad. Great. My name is Brad Waite. And I live at 2416 Charmigan. And I'm speaking today as president of Sustainable Rossmore. Regarding today's agenda item 11C, I'd like to clarify Sustainable Rossmore's position on pickleball courts at Dollar. As only the president or his or her designee is authorized to speak officially for the club. Our club is not necessarily in opposition to those courts at Dollar. And the club's current official position on developing Dollar Park is that Sustainable Rossmore will oppose any development, pickleball or otherwise unless the following three criteria are met. A, and GRF must spell out in detail exactly what alternative sites were considered for the proposed project and why each of the alternatives was determined to be less suitable overall than the one proposed, in this case, Dolly Park. B, after A above is done, the residents of Rossmore be given a clear picture of the proposed project, preferably including the use of story poles so we can better visually see the project's footprint, and then the residents are given sufficient time to express their opinions on the project to the GR Planning Committee and the GR Board. <clears throat> and C, the proposed project will be done in an environmentally responsible manager, manner, including what specific steps the, the developer will take to ensure it, it is, and to mitigate any degradation. Since we are an environmental club, this is our greatest concern here. And further, further, earlier this week, the Vice President of, of Sustainable Rossmore and I met with the Pickleball Club President and Treasurer, and we all believe we're on the same page, especially since the Rossmore Pickleball Club is location neutral in where the courts are cited. You know, thank you very much. Thank you, Brad. Our next, our next resident forum speaker is Richard McLean. Uh, please go ahead and state your full name and Rossmore address for the record. That's you, Marcia. Yes. Uh, good morning. My name is Marcia McLean. I'm speaking on my husband's computer. Um, I live at 2709. Can you turn your speaker down? What am I doing? I live at 2709. Hold on one second, please. This is... We heard you say 2709. Keep, uh, I live at 2709 Golden Rain Road. Um, and thank you for the board for allowing me to speak today. Did you know that one in five seniors struggle with mobility issues? That equates to 2,000 people living here in Rossmore. As a person with mobility issues, Stanley Dollar Park provides me and my husband with a safe place to enjoy the beauty of Rossmore. It is the only outdoor area that is flat. My husband and I were at Dollar Park with 10 of our friends last Friday afternoon before the concert. Of the 12, three used walkers, and those three were there because it is flat. We all know how important it is for our physical and emotional well being to be able to enjoy outdoors. Please do not take that away from the more than 2,000 people that live in Rossmore. Pickleball players deserve an indoor place where they can play year-round. Thank you very much for allowing me to speak. Thank you, Marsha. Now, how do Our, you back? I'll do it right now. Oh. Our next uh, resident forum speaker is Pat Hanscom. Pat, please go ahead and state your full name and Rossmore address. For the record. 
Hi, my name is Pat Hanscom. I'm speaking on behalf of me and my husband, Zach Hanscom. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to address the board. Um, what was your My address? husband and I agree with the 4307 Terra Granada number 3A. Thank you. My husband and I agree that the previous speaker's opposition to paving over the serenity of the area near the old dollar house, we would like to emphasize two points with our time. We're both biologists, ecologists actually. In our view, the project would be, this project would be unnecessarily destructive to the ecology, plant and bird life and soil health of this riparian area. Putting in the courts would actually change the microclimate by removing mature trees, compacting the soil, and installing non-water permeable surfaces. The ensuing noise would disrupt the local and migrant bird populations also. The second point we wanna make is more personal. My husband grew up in this neighborhood over on West Newell Avenue, back before Rossmore. He hiked and camped in these hills and may have even enticed old Mr. Dollar's horses to let him ride through the area. Unnecessary destruction of the area around this historic property is unnecessarily sad. I have no problem with people wanting and deserving uh, pickleball courts, but this is not the place for it. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Pat. Our next Rossmore for, uh, resident forum speaker is Anne Flato, and I'm allowing you to unmute yourself. Please go ahead and state your full name and Rossmore address. Anne Flato, 3711 Terra Granada Drive, apartment 3C. As someone who uses the dollar pool six days a week, and as many days a week as was allowed under the COVID rules. Um, what I enjoy most about the dollar pool is the peace and quiet of the place. I can energize my body by exercising and relax and calm my mind in a beautiful, quiet setting. I'm usually there in the late afternoon when the sun has left the pool and when pickleballers like to play because it's not as hot at that point. And it is wonderful watching the birds fly. There are some, a pair of white kites that nest in the area and you can exercise and just watch the wildlife around you. This would not be the case if there were pickleball courts instead of greenery and trees. The dollar pool is a magical place um, in the evening, and especially when the lights come on. Are you planning to put lights in around the pickleball court? That is another question I have. At a time when the planet is getting hotter and drier and where people are more and more looking to get away from noise and chaos, why, if I may paraphrase an old song, pave over paradise to put in a pickleball court? I have used the, the picnic grounds throughout our COVID confinement, meeting with friends. We would bring lawn chairs and sit around and have a place to converse. Or we would bring a picnic lunch and the ladies would lunch as best we could outdoors. I'm also curious about the statement that lawn uh, pickleball is not compatible with lawn bowling because lawn bowling is a quiet sport and pickleball is not. Well, the people who use the dollar pool and I've asked the lifeguards and this summer, she said approximately 80 people a day use the pool all during the warm weather. So that's about 560 people a week using the pool. Um, if lawn bowling is not compatible with pickleball, why is our peaceful picnic area 
and our peaceful swimming pool compatible with the thwack, thwack, thwack of the pickleball court. Um, I'm all for pickleballers having their own space, which I think should be enclosed so it can be used night and day. But I don't think the green area next Ten seconds. to the dollar house is the appropriate area. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anne. Our next uh, resident forum speaker was Eleanor Vincent. Uh, she did have to leave, but she leaves this comment. The Stanley Dollar Home and Picnic Area is one of the most historic beautiful and accessible green areas used by all Rossmore residents. It hosts many activities from meditation to anniversary and holiday parties. It is a sanctuary for trees, birds, and our creek. I am firmly opposed to any effort to install pickleball courts there for the benefit of one segment of Rossmore while disenfranchising the majority of our 10,000 residents. Everyone should be able to enjoy this beautiful spot in peace. I find it appalling that the, the board would consider paving over this green area, cutting down trees and threatening the restorative power of nature for the majority of residents. In addition, any board member who thinks who, with links to the pickleball club should immediately recuse themselves from voting on this issue. Uh, Eleanor Vincent, 3150 Rossmore Parkway, number two. Our next uh, resident forum speaker is Brett Casper. Brett, I'm allowing you to unmute yourself. Please go ahead and state your full name and Rossmore address. My name is Brett Casper, 1216 Fairlawn Court, number two. Like most people in Rossmore. Ma'am, could you speak up, please? We can barely hear you. Like most people in Rossmore, I moved here to be closer to family. All of the numerous organizations and clubs was another reason. A third very compelling reason was the feeling of nature that was everywhere, especially at the Stanley Dollar Park. Last week, when I listened to the Diablo Symphony Orchestra in the park, it reminded me of the Berkshires Tanglewood in Massachusetts, where the Boston Symphony Orchestra plays. There's an unparalleled restful feeling when listening to beautiful music in a peaceful, natural world setting. My friends and I all relaxed with the gentle, calming sounds of birds and crickets chirping along. Let's not destroy that tranquility by cutting down trees and cementing over the lawn. I'm a pickleball member and I'm all for adding more courts, but not by destroying that unique, idyllic setting. What about the different location? It was discussed, the sportsman's picnic area. What about building a building in there, enclosed, so you don't have to have the swimmers at the dollar pool being just, you know, just you know, destroyed by their peaceful swimming. Um, scientists agree that the world is heating up at a much faster pace than they previously thought. You don't have to be a scientist to feel the effect of concrete heating up the air. When I was walking on a hot day from a cemented path to the grass, I immediately and surprisingly felt a stark difference in temperature. The air above the concrete was hot. The air above the lawn was cool. Try it yourself on a hot day. There will be many more hot days than usual in our future. Let's help keep our natural setting here with the less unnatural and unnecessary concrete and more trees and grass. And let's keep Stanley Dollar as bucolic as it is now. There's an inspirational quote by John Muir. Quote, and into the forest I go to lose my mind and find my soul, unquote. Thank you for your consideration. 
Thank you, Brad. Our next resident forum speaker is uh, Rose Holmes. Rose, I'm allowing you to unmute yourself. Please go ahead and state your full name and Rossmore address for the record. Hi, thank you for allowing me to speak. My name is Rose Holmes and I live at 847 Terra California Drive, number two. I um, just want to express my opinion about this controversy. I am a pickleball club member and I do enjoy the game and I do understand the excitement around the game and how it is very accessible to seniors, which I think is really important, especially for folks who have played other sports throughout their life, like tennis. Um, I do not support putting eight courts into the dollar park. Um, I also like to use the dollar pool and I like to use the, um, the garden behind the dollar building. And I also like to use the meditation room in the library in the dollar clubhouse. And um, even though I love pickleball and I enjoy playing it when my knee allows it, I do not like the sound of pickleballs hitting the paddle. I can hear them from our patio up on Terry, California, and that's only two courts, three, three courts that are at Creekside. Um, you know, I, I, I listened to what Tim had to say about the fact that there is that we are a very developed community with very little open space left. And I think that, you know, as a community, we should want to preserve the dollar park area. And I, I have a lot of issue with the tennis uh, club being able to say, no, 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 you can't touch any of our courts. Um, tennis clubs all over the country are converting tennis courts to pickleball courts because less people of our age group are playing tennis because they're playing more pickleball. So why is it that the tennis club can say, no, you can't touch our land, but those of us that choose to use the dollar complex land um, lose out on this. And I think it's because the tennis club is more organized. And those of us that wanna use the pool or wanna use the green space around Dollar Clubhouse are less organized, although we are working at getting more organized now. But that's kind of an unfair way of looking at our community. Um, going back to what Tim had to say about us being developed with very little land, then maybe we need to look outside of Rossmore. Maybe we need to look at something like the empty Rite Aid building and have eight courts in, inside. I can't imagine eight pickleball courts outside. We're gonna hear that noise everywhere if all eight courts are in use at any given time. And if you're choosing to have tournaments here, that's exactly what we'll have. So I, you know, I, that's, that's my opinion about having develop, develop, developing the dollar air, excuse me, the dollar area. I also would like to just mention um, about the reclusion um, uh, of the board members. I don't agree with that. We are all residents of Rossmore and we are all volunteers that choose to spend our time with different clubs. And if we start saying, oh, you are part of you know, this club or that club and you can't vote um, uh, for something that happens in our community, I don't believe that's fair. I mean, on it, I mean, the tennis, anybody that's on the tennis club needs to recuse themselves. Anybody that's in sustainable Rossmore needs to recuse themselves, depending on what the issue is. So I don't agree with that. We're all volunteers, we're neighbors, we're all residents of this community. I think we need to look at being active, but also preserving our green space. Thank you very much for the time. Thank you, Rose. Our next resident forum speaker is a username Goodwichthel. I'm allowing you to unmute yourself. Please state your full name and a Rossmore address for the record. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, sir. Thank you. Uh, Thelma Brune, my wife, had to leave and she's left me. My name is Sheldon Schwartz, 2137. Skycrest Drive. First of all, thank you for the opportunity for this forum. Thank you for the opportunity to speak as we all are speaking from our hearts and our minds. You volunteers 
on the board of directors uh, do deserve a tremendous amount of acclaim. I have a lot in common with you as I am also a board member and I do not speak to you today as a board member other than to remind you of the fiduciary duty each board member has, the good faith attitude that each board member must have as a board member. I speak to that issue because I think that many people have asked board members on Golden Rain to recuse themselves with regard to this very, very important vote. This is not a vote by Golden Rain to increase because of water increase rates, the HOA fee by $1.70. This vote that this board of directors in Golden Rain is going to take has to do with eliminating nature, trees, the beauty and tranquility of a park that is used by so many of us and our families and for our future. So I want to address primarily, please, each board member give thought to the fact of you recusing yourself because you have a vested interest in pickleball. Number two, eight courts rings a bell to me and I've researched eight courts. I think you as a board of director have failed to disclose the aspect of pickleball courts in the number of eight and the amphitheater in the context of having tournaments. I think you, and that's okay, you have found out that pickleball is extremely important in the country now. And you also have realized that you can have tournaments. You must tell the residents here of your interest in that. It's probably going to be a money-making thing. Nothing the matter with that, but in weighing the money-making aspect, in laying down tons and tons of cement next to a creek that you already admitted is causing the other courts to crack. You hadn't mentioned that. Hopefully you will. This is not an athletic club. Rossmore, Rossmore is a retirement area and the park gives rise to that. So please, please recuse yourself if you've got a vested interest. Please look at the park in its long-term natural effect. Sounds silly to look at the aspect of birds chirping, but go out there some afternoon, take some time and sit there and love the park as most of us do. 500 people in a club must not dictate what 10,000 people want to use. Thank you for the opportunity. Bless all of you. Thank you, Sheldon. Our next resident forum speaker is Janet Selden. Janet, please go ahead and state your full name and Rossmore address for the record. Janet Selden, 2100 Skycrest, number eight. Um, what Sheldon said about the creek, if the creek needs shoring up, which clearly it does on the creek side, then that should be part of the deal. And as you stated, the options given are all gonna cost more money than we thought. They're all gonna cost about the same money. Why not protect the creek? Shore up the creek, make it safer for habitat, for trees, and expand the pickleball courts where they currently are. I am totally not in agreement with destroying the Stanley Dollar Park. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Our next resident forum speaker is Leslie Yoshitani. Leslie, please go ahead and state your full name and Rossmore address, and then you may have three minutes to address the board. Thank you, Lisa. Good morning, everyone. My name is Leslie Yoshitani. I live on 2025 Golden Rain, number two, and moved here two years ago. 
uh, I thank the entire board for allowing us to share our comments. I'm speaking up in support of protecting the Dollar Park. I'm concerned about protecting the Tice Creek watershed. The habitat along the creek is what drew me to the park at least several days a week for birding. From the very beginning, I found the park within a couple of days after I moved here. It's a prime habitat for local and migrating birds and is the lifeblood of the Dollar Park and deserves protection. It provides me and many others with limited mobility, a level safe place to renew and enjoy and study nature. I'm aware that the banks along the creek at the current site of the courts at Creekside have eroded making renewal of those courts for use unlikely and therefore I question another project further up the creek. Um, and that's all for now. Thanks very much. Thank you, Leslie. Um, our next uh, resident forum speaker is SN. ELS Snells. Um, uh, looks like she uh, or he or she has uh, left the meeting. Okay, next is uh, Karen Perkins. Karen, I'm allowing you to unmute yourself. Go ahead and state your full name and Rossmore address for the record. I don't seem to unmute. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can, Karen. Okay. Karen Perkins at 1935 Golden Rain. Um, I'm concerned that destroying the dollar picnic area will lower my property values. I'm told one of the first places realtors take prospective buyers is to the dollar house and picnic area and sometimes eat lunch there with clients. It's not only a historical house, it's a feature no other retirement or senior community has. Residents have said because they had to give up their homes many when they moved here, and downsize that they, that they um, it reminds them of home. It's symbolic in that sense. It's so treasured, it's been called the jewel of the valley. The vast majority of buyers looking to buy in Rossmore will very likely be people who do not play pickleball. Um, but I would bet every one of them has visited a park for picnics, playing and relaxing. Um, anyway, um, I wonder what they think about destroying the charm and peacefulness of the dollar picnic area and replacing it with eight noisy pickleball courts. As I said, I'm seriously afraid it would impact property values here. Some have suggested te tennis players share the courts with pickleball players on different days and times. Sharing is good. However, sharing, um, if sharing can't be done, it would seem the next best solution would, would be to build an air conditioned building where pickleball players could play year round, even in hot weather, which also would be soundproof. Perhaps the empty lot overgrown with brown weeds, which is an eyesore between Hillside Pool and Shady Glen Park could accommodate three or four courts. And actually there's a little storage shed down a few steps from there on flat land that actually um, has a walkway to it that could probably accommodate one or two more, maybe one more. Um, at Gateway, there is still another large flat overgrown eyesore with weed space behind the studios in front of the billiards building. Also it gave way there is part of the parking lot used temporarily for contractor storage, which could be used for a building and could be enlarged by using more of the parking lot nearby. Parking lots have not been full here very seldom um, since the event center was built, Fireside, Diablo Room, and the fitness center, particularly um, since the Sierra Room has been taken out of there as the dance um, big room um, are not full very very often, if ever. So um, so basically the fitness center may, maybe um, I said it was could never full that I've ever seen. And, and maybe they could even put a, a second floor on the fitness center, um, a second story of, of sorts. May, it might probably be as cheap, cheap maybe, I don't know, you know, is building a whole new building. It's all to make it air conditioned and soundproof just like the other two down below. Um, there are other options than destroying dollar picnic area. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, <clears throat> um, 
Yeah, yeah. So I was saying the whole length of the fitness center roof, <clears throat> excuse me, um, the whole length of the fitness center roof could maybe even accommodate eight courts, but I don't know. But anyway, <clears throat> um, I, I really um, think that the dollar area um, should not be, should be totally off limits for such a thing. And someone had referred to me as I wrote a letter saying, about the grassy area behind the, the house. I was not sure what you were talking about when you're talking about just, you know, building pickleball courts at Dollar. And you didn't mention that the first paragraph of the letter I wrote seconds. was all about Dollar picnic area and why that should be preserved for, for recreation and relaxation. Time. Thank you, Karen. Our next speaker is uh, Nancy Thursby. Nancy, I'm allowing you to speak. Please go ahead and state your full name and Rossmore address for the record. I just got back from the doctor. Perfect timing. Nancy, <laughs> 4503 Terra Granada Drive, apartment 3A, entry 16. Um, I basically have a question. Um, I'm overlooking the golf course, the end of the golf course, and I can see the tennis right there. And it appears to me that there is space uh, further in um, where the tennis is. And I'm, I'm, my question is, uh, why is it necessary to take away courts? Why couldn't the pickleball courts just be added at the back of the tennis center? I don't know if anybody wants to answer that or um, that's because uh, uh, it seems to me all the discussion has been take away two tennis courts. Well, you know, has anybody thought of just adding the pickleball in the same area um, and not taking, I can see why they would be upset if they just got new courts and then we wanted to take them away. Um, I'm, I love pickleball. I'm a member of the club. I have been and um, I, I really hope that, you know, a space can be found. And since I can see this from here, I'm just wondering if it's an option. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, as a reminder, the board does not uh, answer questions posed during the residence forum, but the members do consider them as they act. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Our next uh, forum speaker is Liz Rudder. Liz, I'm allowing you to unmute yourself. Go ahead and state okay. your full name and Rossmore address. Hi, I'm Liz Rudder. I live at 2549 Pine Knoll Drive, number seven. I am a pickleball player. I've started pickleball just before I moved here four years ago. I'm also a tennis player. I swim at Dollar. I play um, bocce. So I'm not just one thing. And one thing I want to, I'm very impressed by listening to all the um, comments and about uh, what Tim said about the um, pickleball. I, I've learned a lot. Um, one of the things I want to say is that um, I, I don't want dollar paved over either. I love to swim at dollar. One of the things I think is not whether we should have um, a pickleball facility. We have a pickleball facility, but the scope of it. Um, I, I think I'm going to talk briefly about that. One of the things about pickleball being so incredibly popular and growing so fast is that pickleball is played in short bursts of one game, then you sit. So you always I play pickleball in Alameda, Oakland, El Cerrito, Albany, um, Rudgear, Concord. I've played in all of the area um, pickleball courts. One of the things that's the most fun and the reason pickle, one of the reasons pickleball has expanded so much is that it's a sport. It's an easy sport to learn. You can be an old fat old lady like me and play it pretty well. Um, you also get to watch it. You also get to be a spectator. This, which people love to do is, is you know, they want to watch with each other and talk to each other. In pickleball, you play, then you sit, then you talk to people. Sometimes I've had more fun talking to people while I'm waiting to play pickleball. So if you have 
one court. You don't want to have four people. Now with the gym, it's so underused. You have to beg people, please um, play another game. People want to sit out. So we, I, I believe one of the, the scope of it, we don't really need eight courts. We, we don't need the same number of courts that we have people playing. We, the, you should have about four times, three or four times as many people waiting as you have courts. That works out so well for being both a spectator, getting to talk to each other and playing a lot. Um, the other thing is that um, I don't understand this about tournaments um, and money making. We certainly don't need that. I've played tournaments all over the Bay Area. We certainly don't need tournaments here. You don't want more people coming in the gate. Um, if this is simply a money-making thing, I, I'm very surprised to hear that um, people want tournaments. Also, there may be 500 people in the pickleball club, but very few of them are playing seconds. regularly. Um, and very, even fewer of them probably want to play in tournaments. I think what, one thing that happens when you get a board of a club is Time. a person comes on the board and doesn't say, let's keep things as they are. Let's they always want to have bigger and better. Um, I think smaller um, would be better. It'd be nice to have some new, you know, fixed up courts at. Um, uh, at Excuse me, Liz, but your time is up. Is there okay, another point thanks. you'd like to That's make? That's all I have to say. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. Our next forum speaker is Leela. Oh, she has lowered her hand. Okay. Um, let's see. All right. Our next forum speaker is Carol. Uh, Carol Weed, please go ahead and state your full name and Ross Moore address. Hello. Good morning. Hello. My name is Carol Weed. I live at 1277 Avenida Sevilla 2A, entry two. Um, I'm a member of the Nature Walkers Club, but I'm speaking as an individual. I would encourage anyone who thinks of the area that we're addressing in terms of Dollar Park and Arboretum as, quote, the unused area east of the clubhouse or the open area east of the clubhouse, actually visit it. I think a lot of people in Rossmore have been there. It would be worthwhile to walk to the end of the area. It's further than most people realize it even is in length and sit there a while and listen to the creek and listen to the birds and other and watch the wildlife. I think you'd be surprised and have a natural experience that you weren't aware of exists in Rossmore and perhaps value it more. But I mainly want to comment on new the new business item in the agenda, item 11C, that has to do with the conflict of interest. I think it would be a shame for the board and staff to consider that only in light of pickleball and only in light of which members belong to which clubs and how many clubs. That's not what conflict of interest is about. In, area, in, in city council meetings and other groups of elected officials outside of Rossmore, there's a professional understanding and typically bylaws or operating pr principles that stipulate that when there's a vote to take place where one person would stand to benefit more than others or benefit more than is the good for the community involved, that they would recuse themselves. Most of the time that happens is a voluntary action on the part of the elected person. It doesn't, it's not required as some action to be enforced, but most other bodies have a procedure by which other members of the board can require it if a person doesn't recuse themselves. But it really has more to do with um, a disproportionate benefit to one board member um, disproportionate to the common good. So I would hope that as you review this policy that you focus on that and not on some limited current issue. It's much more important than that. Thank you. 
Thank you, Carol. Uh, our next resident forum speaker oops, is uh, let's see, Nancy. Nancy Werner. Nancy, I'm allowing you to unmute yourself. Please go ahead and state your full name and Rossmore address. Uh, my name is Nancy Werner. I'm at 5913 Horseman's Canyon Drive, Unit 2A. I am a pickleball club member and I really and I also play tennis and I really appreciate my elder years being able to play pickleball. I'm getting a little too old for tennis. I, and I love the fact that you, you can play and you can watch and it's very sociable. So I'm very, very much in favor. Of, and I think most people agree that pickleball should be, uh, uh, should be supported. Um, the tournament issue, I mean, a lot of these tournaments, I mean, lawn bowling has them, tennis has them, golf has them. So a lot of them, some of them are just between the members. They're not bringing other people in. It just gives people a chance to compete and, and to, uh, to get that side of them expressed. So I don't think that that's, and, and more courts would also be useful in that now you have to wait for your slot, for your, your skill level to play. I would play a lot more if I were able to play a lot more, but I have to wait maybe once a day at my skill level, or maybe I have to go to the open or, or whatever. It's difficult to get, get time to play with that. If we had more courts, we would have more more accessibility to people who wanted to play. So you can't judge because we've just got a few courts as to how many people are playing. A lot more people would play if we had more courts, that's for sure. And the other, other thing mentioned was the noise and the, the bubble and all that stuff. I certainly would be able to, able, would, would be happy to contribute to, to helping them build an indoor facility. That would be wonderful so that we could play all day and we wouldn't bother anybody else. So that's about all I have to say. I, I'm just for the for building more courts, and I hope it doesn't up, you know, hurt the dollar area either. But that's up to the board. Thank you, Nancy. Our next uh, resident forum speaker is uh, Marilyn Schuyler. Marilyn, I'm allowing you to unmute yourself. Please go ahead and state your full name and Rossmore address. Great, thank you so much. My name is Marilyn Schuyler. Uh, my address is 1349 Running Springs Road, a number seven entry 10. I appreciate the chance to take a few minutes today to express my views um, on this issue. Uh, I'm a member of the Pickleball Club and I just wanna make it clear that I am fully supportive of the need <clears throat> for new pickleball courts. I think uh, residents are being presented with a false narrative and choice that <clears throat> it's a pickleball uh, or the dollar park. <clears throat> We're being told that the only viable choice <clears throat> for pickleball is the dollar park. This is not true. Uh, we need a comparable and comparative viability studies done for other possible sites, including the tennis courts, the lawn bowling courts, and possibly even Sportsman Park and the bocce ball courts. I don't think it's sufficient to say that those sites have been, quote, considered. What does considered mean? Does that mean a few members of the staff have said they're not viable? Does that mean that members of those clubs have said, no, we're not willing to share our facility or give up part of our facility for pickleball? That's not adequate. That's, uh, the residents of Rossmore deserve more than that. We want comparative studies done regarding those sites the same kind of studies that, it be, that is being done on the Dollar Park. Um, and the other question I have, and, and I'll, uh, I'll end with this, is it's my understanding that all the residents of Rossmore have paid for construction of those facilities. We all paid through our dues for construction of the tennis courts. We've all paid 
for construction of the lawn bowling courts. We've all paid for construction of the bocce ball. We've all paid for part of the construction of the table tennis facility. And it's my understanding that we all pay, very importantly, for the maintenance of those facilities, including water use bills for the lawn bowling facility. And I, so I think it's important that each club not be given veto power over whether a portion of their facility could be re reallocated or used for pickleball. I find it really hard to believe that two of the, of the, of the courts, just two of the tennis courts <clears throat> cannot be repurposed for pickleball. Or similarly, that one <clears throat> of the lawn bowling uh, court <clears throat> could not be repurposed for pickleball. So I would just, and also in terms of recusal, I trust each and every GRF board member to make <clears throat> an unbiased <clears throat> decision that will be in the best interest of all members of Rossmore. That includes members of the Pickleball Club, two of whom I know and I think very highly of. It also Ten includes one, one board member who's a member of the tennis club. So I would just appeal to every member of the GRF board to make a very fair and unbiased decision. And I just would hope Dollar Park is protected from development. Thank you for your time. Lisa, before we move forward, I just wanna make one clarification. All capital items, uh, buildings, uh, new facilities are paid through the, ma the member transfer fee and not through the coupon. Just wanna make sure everybody understands that. Thank you, Dwight. And thank you, Marilyn. Uh, our next uh, resident forum speaker is Herbert Bernstein. I'm allowing you to unmute yourself. Please go ahead and state your full name and Rossmore address. Uh, my name is Herbert Bernstein. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, I live at 1621 Tomigan Drive, apartment 3A. Let me start off by saying I'm not opposed and I'm in agreement that the pickleball people need a space for their sport. But if you look at statistics, the number of people in the pickleball club represents approximately 6% of Rossmore population. That leaves 94% who still come and enjoy Stanley Park, whether it be for a picnic, or a family outing, or a concert, or to use the pool. And I think it would be a disgrace to destroy that beautiful natural environment to pickleball courts. There certainly has to be other places, particularly up where the tennis courts are. Maybe take adding to the existing tennis courts, taking a small piece of the golf course at the perimeter of that golf course could possibly be used for pickleball. I can't believe that this site, which is can be used by so much, such a large portion of our population for all kinds of purposes, and it cannot be destroyed and paved over for pickleball. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Thank you. Our next resident forum speaker is uh, Carol Serioni. Uh, she tells me she's got her, she had her earlier technical issues uh, addressed. Uh, please go ahead and state your full name and Rossmore address. Hi, I'm Carol Cerrone, and I live at 2528 Tarmigan Drive, number three. Um, after listening to everybody, I've kind of revised what I was going to say. That was the one advantage of not being able to get on right away. First of all, I think there is no question that we all love nature and take solace in the beauty that surrounds us. However, supporting progress and supporting nature are not necessarily at odds with one another. 
I do think that people are overreacting to this particular area. Um, we have beautiful tennis courts of which I just saw last night and was amazed. Uh, the bocce ball course, table tennis facility, golf courses, swimming pools, gardening area, lawn bowling facility, trails for walkers and hikers, a dog park, and all sorts of artists and photography studios. Those are great things for Ross Morians in general. And I think that's what we need to look at. It's what's good for us as a community for future as well as for present. Um, and I think that the us against them mentality has really slowed down that process. And I also think that the idea of a board member, just because they belong to a club, have to recuse themselves from voting. That's, those are not board members I would want on the board. I want board members I trust to make the right decision, no matter what they do, what their outside interests are. So I think we need to put that to bed because this is treading on dangerous ground. You don't just change a process because you may not like the outcome. So I think we need to think seriously about that. Um, <clears throat> I think that we entrusted our GRF board to make decisions based on facts that have been presented before them. Their job as I see it is to keep their eyes on the pulse of the future, to protect our home values, make sure all community structures and surrounding grounds are in good or excellent condition, and to make sure our community continues to encourage and entice those who are 55 plus to choose Rossmore as their place of residence. Residents coming here are in better health than ever. They seek physical activity that they'll be able to pursue well into their 80s. And based on the size and the rate of growth of the pickleball club, it's clear that a large number of them are choosing this particular sport. And after listening to the plans for dollar, it seems to me that great pains have been taken to incorporate beauty and function while developing pickleball courts and a pavilion at the site. Um, I'm not going to list all of the reasons we need more pickleball courts. It's a fact that one of the largest, it's one of the largest clubs in Rossmore and that our current facilities are woefully lacking and in great disrepair to the point Time. of being dangerous. Um, <clears throat> I think what's most important here is to put our trust in the GRF board to know that you have the interest of Rossmoreans in mind. And I think that's what's really important not looking at an us against them. But I just want you to know that I have my trust squarely set with you. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Uh, we have two folks left who had requested to speak prior to the start of Residence Forum. Uh, the first of those last two is Carol Lair. Carol, I'm allowing you to unmute yourself. Please go ahead and state your full name and Ross Moore address. Hi, Carol Lair, 1160 Singingwood, um, number 12. And I'm not talking about pickleball. Um, so I just uh, wanted to Remind everybody, I'm the president of the Rossmore Lampardary and Jewelry Club, and we've been watching the renovation of the sewing club and the ceramic studios, and they look so good. And I just want to remind you guys that there are three studios left, and we hope that you will approve the budget to do those studios um, next year. So I won't take up any more of your time right now, but um, I'm glad I got a chance to just remind you about the studio renovations. Thanks very much. Thank you, Carol. All right, our final, and for all of our resident forum speakers, they do appreciate your patience. Our final speaker is Marsha. Uh, username Marsha McLean, but who we already heard from, but I'm told that uh, this person is using a Marsha's computer. Um, so go right ahead and unmute yourself and please state your full name and Rossmore address. 
My name is Ann Foreman. I live at 5333 Terra Granada Drive 1A. Uh, going back to pickleball, I've heard everybody today some really good points made. I don't play pickleball, but I really support the pickleball players. I want them to have a building, wherever it can be. Why can't we do fundraising? Why can't we have a committee, couple of GRF people, some pickleball players, some non-pickleball players? I don't play, but I would donate money. I think there's money here in Rossmore to add to any GRF funds that we can get so that Pickleball can have a beautiful building. I'd be on the committee. I hope you consider the idea of fundraising. I think we can raise money here for a Pickleball building so there wouldn't be the noise issue. You've been so patient listening to all of this. I can't believe you've done this. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Anne. Mr. President, that was our final resident forum speaker. Hey, thank you, Lisa. And thank you, Marsha, for recognizing that we, uh, we were able to concentrate during that whole thing. Uh, so let's move ahead to the resident member committee reports. First up is aquatics. Uh, Richard, before I call on you, I just want to say that last week the board received word that Brian Stack uh, resigned from the Aquatics Committee. We want to thank Brian for his eight years of tireless and dedicated work on the committee. Uh, obviously, his coaching and aquatics experience certainly assisted uh, Rossmore with its aquatics program and especially in surviving the pandemics, uh, pandemic health protocols. So thank you, Brian. And uh, in Brian's stead today, we have uh, Richard Geisner. Uh, presenting the report. Richard? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, uh, I had to move to a phone because we had to talk, take the dog to the vet. Um, I have uh, reviewed the uh, report dated uh, September 9th, and I have found it to be accurate. Uh, does the board have any questions to ask? I don't see any. So, Richard, we thank you and hope your dog is okay. All right. I appreciate it. You have a great day. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, next up is Audit Committee, uh, Merrick Lipson. Good morning. Um, the Audit Committee met on September 13th. We started with an announcement from the Foundation's external independent audit firm, Shea Labaud Dauberstein, or SLD. Um, we learned that effective September 1st, uh, SLD had been acquired by a national company that provides accounting, tax, and uh, advisory services called CBiz Inc. That's the letter C B I Z. Um, from now on, this means that uh, our auditors will be known as CBiz SLD. And we were advised that this change won't adversely affect the services that they provide to the foundation um, because the executive team, the staffing, and the pricing of our audits uh, will remain the same. However, uh, we were told that SLD uh, or CBiz SLD audits will now come to us through yet another CBiz uh, subsidiary, uh, a national independent CPA firm called Mayor Hoffman McCann PC. Thus we can accept to, expect to see that uh, the firm's initials MHM on future audits. Getting down to business, uh, we reviewed with CBiz SLD uh, their draft audit reports on the foundation's uh, pension plan audit, uh, pension plan and uh, 401k plan for the year ended, ending 2020. Uh, the good news is that the results were uh, as expected. There were no problems and they were consistent with the results from last year. Um, the committee 
unanimously approved the draft reports and communications. Um, I understand final signed versions, uh, which are unchanged, have now been received uh, by the GRF. And we recommend that the board approve and adopt them. Our CBIS SLD briefed us on significant financial reporting and accounting developments. Uh, they advised us that accounting standard 136 issued by the American Institute of CPAs, uh, which is known as SAS 136, is going to take effect next year. Uh, it requires some procedural and naming changes for audits of employee benefit plans. And this means that uh, SAS 136 will apply to next year's audits of the GRF pension plan and 401k plan. Uh, CBIS SLD also reminded us that new uh, lease accounting standards go into effect next year that may affect the foundation's solar power purchasing agreement. Um, we next uh, received uh, the or addressed the subject of the foundation's enterprise risk management efforts. Um, CFO Joel Lesser reviewed with us the status of the uh, management's 27 item list of potential risks. That's the same list that uh, the board uh, considered uh, or reviewed at its meeting last month. Um, the audit committee asks that uh, management continue to present and update us annually on the status of GRS ERM activities. Finally, uh, the committee adopted a proposed meeting schedule and topics uh, for this coming year. Uh, CEO Tim O'Keefe uh, noted that CBIS SLD will be finishing its three-year commitment to the GRF next year. And therefore, he reminded us that when the audit committee uh, meets in June of 2022, uh, it will need to consider whether the GRF should continue to engage uh, the services of CBIS SLD or should issue a request uh, for a proposal to hire an alternative firm. Uh, and then after a recess, the committee met in, in executive session to uh, consider a personnel matter. Our next meeting is going to be on November 1st. We'll review CBIS SLD's scope and planning for the big uh, audit of uh, GRF's 2021 financials. Uh, we'll also receive a management update on the GRS uh, financial controls from uh, Joel Lesser. Uh, and finally, uh, we're going to consider initiating a review of the need for any revisions uh, or updates to our committee charter and to the audit committee related GRF policies. If you have any questions, I'd be pleased to answer them. All right, any questions for Merrick? Merrick, thanks for your committee's good work on that. Uh, Tim, do we need a uh, motion to accept those financial statements or is that? Yes. We do? Okay. Mary, do you have a motion maybe? I move that, repeat the, repeat the question please, Dwight. So, uh, so the audit committee approved the uh, financial statements for the 401k and pension plan. Do you want to make a motion to, to accept yeah. that recommendation? I will move that we accept the committee's approval of the uh, audit pro audit procedures for the uh, 401k and pension plan. Okay. Is there for the, a... for the year 2020. Right, for the year 2020. Thank you, Tim. And Paul, did I see you seconding that? Okay, I, yeah, Paul is saying yes. Okay, any questions? Discussion? All right, uh, roll call, Deborah. Certainly. Walker? Yes. Stumpel? Yes. Hamaji? Yes. Hart? Yes. Bentley? Yes. Brown? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Harrington? Yes. Madaraki? Yes. Unanimous. Okay. Thank you very much.
And Merrick, thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, next up is Finance Committee, uh, Bill Dorban. Before you start, Bill, I just say, I want to say I want to thank you and the members of the Finance Committee for all your work uh, over the past month. Long meetings, but productive meetings in terms of the budget. Uh, you address a number of big issues, and most importantly, the GRF portion of the 2022 coupon. So thanks to you and your committee members. Thank you. Uh, the Finance Committee met on September the 28th via Zoom. Um, I've submitted to the board a uh, written copy of that report and along with it, a copy of the coupon computation with one adjustment that I would like to now describe to you more in more detail. The committee reviewed the draft of the operation, 2022 operations budget submitted by staff, which had been previously discussed at the joint meeting. We were informed that Comcast is attempting to raise its rates by 4% for 2022, in spite of late notices given by them. The initial draft of the operations budget called for a decrease of $183,463 in anticipation of no, in, uh, 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 no increase in the Comcast rates. So we thought that they were not going to be able to raise them now it appears that they might, and we don't know what the outcome of that is gonna be. We're disputing that right now. So we eliminated that hoped for reduction in the coupon in the calculation and replaced it with a like amount of additional surplus, which was also then allocated uh, to the budget. Uh, as a result, the committee recommends that the coupon of 308.57 uh, be set for 2022. This is in keeping with the coupon increase at 5.99% for 2022, which the participants suggested by a straw vote taken at the joint meeting. The recommendation is summarized in the attachment. Basically, we swapped out uh, what we hoped for was going to be a reduction, excuse me, a non-increase, and uh, added additional money to uh, uh, bring us to the 5.99 number. That's the recommendation of the uh, committee. Okay. Any questions? So we, and we will be discussing the budget uh, later in another agenda item. Bill, did you have anything else to report or? Uh, the, the only other recommendation was uh, that we, um, uh, the committee recommends that the income generated from the forgiveness of the payroll protection plan loan and its accrued interest, 3,600,000 plus, be allocated in the following way, $383,000 even to Mutual Operations Division and the balance, 3228 562.72 be allocated to GRF operations. That would be for showing the income at the end of the year. That's Great. it. Any, any questions for Bill at this point? Like we'll be addressing both of those issues later in the agenda. So I, I have one question for you, Bill. So um, finance committee members, to the best of my knowledge, are coupon paying residents of Rossmore. At any time, do you believe that with that financial uh, connection that those members have, uh, that they did not act in the best interests of all residents of Rossmore? Uh, absolutely not. Uh, we're, all, we're all residents. We're all, we're all uh, uh, you know, assessing ourselves when the time comes for recommendations and so on. No, there's absolutely no reason for any uh, uh, members of the finance committee not to be including their, their votes. And what's more, we, uh, uh, everyone uh, files a, uh, a conflict of interest form indicating whether or not they have any economic benefit from any of the decision, individual economic benefits from any of the decisions that are made by the, by the uh, committee. Okay. So thank you for no that. problem. All right, appreciate it. All right, moving on. Uh, Fitness Center Advisory, uh, Jim Grizel. So I see Jim is in uh, as an attendee. Jim, I am unmuting you. You are welcome to uh, begin speaking. Okay, uh, let's see. I can't see me. Hopefully you can hear me at least. Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, 
Well, I hope if you have any questions about that uh, report from last month, feel free to ask me those. I have um, quite, quite a few nice little items here to report. Um, Gina, the fitness manager, told me that they um, have had um, not seen any test results, but everybody who's checked in to the fitness center um, have shown their vaccinations. The key fob set up is now set so that the uh, those who have been checked and vaccinated, they just can check in with the key fobs. Uh, there were, during the time setting up the computer systems, they did lose about four days of um, visit visits. So that I think is going to amount to about 1,500 to 3,000 uh, visits during a four day period that won't be included in the next report. Um, she did hire a fitness desk staff member, Taylor, Taylor Robinson, who will be there Saturday, Sunday, and early Mondays and early Tuesdays. She's got a new group instructor, Virginia Dara, who will start tomorrow. The uh, diabetes and dementia prevention program is moving along pretty good. It looks like they uh, have got things back on track and have started the, uh, whatever the measurements that they have to do. Um, that new uh, applicant that you hopefully will approve later on for our co committee members. Um, one thing that I noticed, uh, we, we lost Robert Remington. He is not on the committee now and uh, he was a nurse, retired nurse. The person we're recommending uh, is a retired retired nurse, so kind of a good medical compliment to the committee. Um, I listened to some of the, the financial reports, and what I see from our data is that the revenue for the fitness center uh, is up a little bit, and uh, we'll continue. A little projection that Gina had looked at is that we're going to be above budget by the end of the year easily and above and still below what it was in 2019 before COVID. The unique visits uh, right now are remaining about 2,300 a month. That's individual users. Like, so about 23% of the Rossmore residents uh, use the fitness center in a given month. Uh, at the end of 2019, it was up, up around uh, 2,800. So about 28% of the residents used the fitness center then. So hopefully that will start increasing. Um, the unique personal training clients stays at about 100 per month. And we figured that that average is about $138 a month per client. Um, so that's something to think about in terms of increasing revenue and helping the trainers get a little extra income by providing personal training. Uh, I think that covers everything I had. Um, do you have any questions for me? Any questions for Jim? Jim, appreciate it. And uh, good also, luck with, uh, with your committee. Okay, also quick, if you look at the slides, uh, we created some about revenue and comparing revenue over the last pre-COVID and now. So uh, if you have any questions about those in the future, we'll try to do the same type of slides in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, uh, moving on, golf, a pretty story. Um, golf continues to be a popular pastime and, and we appreciate the revenue from that. John, how are you today? I'm fine, thank you. Good. Good. And uh, you couldn't have said it better. The uh, golf is just going bananas. Uh, there were 7,000 rounds um, last month and that's we've had several 7,000 uh, round months. It's projected that there'll be uh, 80,000 rounds by the time we get to the end of the year compared to 34,000 last year. Um, I believe we've crossed the 1 million revenue mark. Um, I would point out in terms of um, to the management report that if you look at the golf shop figures, there's also a reflection of an increase in revenue from like lessons and uh, the uh, revenue from the ball machine and from uh, golf cart uh, rentals. But I want the board to remember that all of those increases and in all of that business around the pro shop um, it, it doesn't reflect the increase in the level of effort by the people in the pro shop. Uh, lessons have almost doubled. Uh, that's, you know, individuals uh, 
uh, time that are given by the pro shop staff to the to the residents who are learning, uh, and just keeping the the uh, place stocked and cleaned and uh, all that goes on. So it's a real, I mean, it's a real circus atmosphere down in the pro shop right now. Uh, keeping that in mind. Also point out in the uh, superintendent's report how, uh, and, and we've mentioned this before, how very aware of water usage we are. Got a little uh, a break this month because the heat generates actually more water for us. Um, we do have uh, an introduction of Bermuda grass. It's an attempt to use less water and get better coverage. Um, and uh, they're doing a lot of spot, uh, spot weed control. So all of those things uh, are uh, just reflective of how well managed the golf course is and we should all appreciate that. So uh, the rest of the uh, information is in, the, uh, is in your packet. So I don't have anything else to add to that. John, a good report. Any questions for John? I see Mark is uh, also available if somebody has a question there. I don't see any, but I, I have one question for you, John. So uh, golf advisory committee members or members of various uh, clubs here in Rossmore that uh, are associated with golf. I assume that most, if not all, are also paying customers to play golf. At any time, do you believe that uh, those members act in the best interest or do you, do you feel that they didn't act in the best interest of all residents of Rossmore as committee members? No, I think I... Uh... I would just parallel what uh, Bill said earlier. I mean, we are all uh, residents of Rossmore to start with, so we're always uh, aware of the uh, best interest of Rossmore. Um, the committee does fill out their conflict of interest statement uh, every year. Uh, the committee supported increases in green fees, for instance, over uh, you, you know over the year. That affects uh, all the residents, and you know we just. I will just say, I think the board members, especially the GRF board members are locally elected and presumably because the members trust their judgment, uh, the board also lives here. And, uh, you know, unless someone has a relative bidding on a project or something, I don't see how recusal comes into play. And that itself would fall under the uh, existing conflict of interest rule. So, no, I think uh, I'm quite comfortable with that um, both the, 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 the boards of the various golf clubs and, uh, the, uh, golf advisory committee always have an eye on the, uh, total resident population. So. Okay. Thank you, John. Appreciate that. So with that, uh, before we go to board committee reports, I think it's good timing to take another five minute break. Uh, so let's return at 1155. And we might get lunch today, sometime. <laughs> okay, it is 11.55. I'm sure Tim will be jumping on at any second. But um, why don't we get started with uh, board committee reports. Uh, first up, planning, Leanne Hamaji. Yes. Um, well, in addition to our monthly update on capital projects, um, we began the early stages of revising the Rossmore uh, general plan. And for those listening, listening who are not familiar with the general plan, it is um, a type of um, a vision of Rossmore covering all the aspects of Rossmore and what we, what is currently done in those areas and what we hope to do. So it's going to be a long process. It's a document that is updated every five years. Uh, the discussions we had at the planning committee were basically logistical discussions about how to launch the revision process and um, We'll, it will, we'll have f further discussions on that. Uh, currently, the committee members are reviewing the chapters that they selected to review. They're looking at what no longer applies. They're looking, they're thinking about what may be needed 
uh, might be added. And um, we'll be discussing that again. I said, like I said, in the coming months, it will take a quite a quite a while to get through it. Um, and then also we voted to uh, recommend to the GRF board that uh, a new trail be created and named. And I believe Rebecca Pollan might be speaking about that um, after this. And that's about, oh, and our next meeting is October 14th. And that's it. Okay, thank you. And actually, uh, well, any questions on that portion uh, of Leanne? And I see where Rebecca is here. And uh, next on the agenda is the Trails Club proposal. Rebecca? Yeah, so um, a couple of weeks ago, I presented to the planning committee about a proposal that the Trails Club has developed um, to provide all the construction to create a new trail that will link where an existing trail ends and where another trail begins. Um, and so there will be no cost to GRF, although in the long run, we will probably have to do a little bit of maintenance on the trail. And there may be other things that come up that we may need to contribute funds for, but it will be very minimal um, and probably easily manageable in our current trails budget each year. Um, so there, there will be no new name for the trail. It's actually just an extension of an existing trail called the Skyline Trail. And I will show everybody roughly where it is. And excuse me for being out of breath, I ran back to the office. <laughs> <laughs> You, you sound like you just went on a hike and you're- I know, I, I knew I was coming up and I was like, I gotta go, I gotta go. Okay, so um, can everybody see the map on the screen? Yes. So just to orient you, this is the, en oops, this is the entry gate here and we're facing north. Here's Rossmore Parkway. Eagle Ridge is here. So the new trail is the Skyline Trail Extension. So the existing Skyline Trail, let me back out so you can see this. The existing Skyline Trail starts at the end of Autumnwood, comes along here and then ties into Mutual 68 property. Currently, when you walk this trail, you have to walk along Mutual 68 to then pick up um, on the dollar trail over here. So what they've done is they, um, they did a lot of scouting to figure out where they could build a trail, which would neither be visible from Mutual 68 or visible from the Rossmore Parkway entries below. Um, and it does you know, sort of traverse a couple of creeks in here, but it stays out of sight of everybody that would necessarily be concerned. Um, if it looks to you like there's already a trail here, you know, sadly we can't use that because it is the disking trail. Um, so it gets turned over every year. Um, and that is really the full proposal. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, Rebecca, did uh, anybody talk to Mutual 68 uh, board about this proposal? No. Okay, I did. <laughs> they seem they seem to like it. So I don't know that they took a formal vote, but I just wanted to let you know I did talk to them. Okay. Uh, Paul? Hi, have we had many complaints about uh, people walking on trails that we need to um, be cognizant of the fact that uh, the trails are out of the way or out of the sight lines of people above and below. I wouldn't think that that's much of an issue. It can be. So there have been trails that were proposed in the past that passed within the sight line or particularly close to people's buildings, and they felt that it was going to infringe upon their privacy. Um, and so those trails were not ultimately developed, but there are a couple of trails around <clears throat> where they do pass in front of the window of um, somebody's home, although we have not received any complaints to that effect. But whenever they do suggest new trails, because this is not the first one, um, I've gone out and taken a look to make sure that, you know, A, it doesn't cross onto mutual property, because these have to be exclusively on GRF property, um, and B, that, you know, it wouldn't give residents reason to object uh, for one reason or another. So the short answer to your question is, yes, we have received complaints before, and we have stopped the development of trails for that reason in the past. Okay, any other questions for Rebecca? Anybody want to make a motion in regards to this uh, approval of this trail? I so move. Paul? Okay, thank you, Dale. Paul, did I see a second from you? Sure, second. Okay, excellent. Any discussion? Okay, roll call, Deborah. Certainly, Walker. Yes. Stumpho? Yes. Amaji? Yes. Hurt? Yes. 
Bentley? Yes. Brown? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Harrington? Yes. Madaraki? Yes. Okay, thank you everybody. Thank you, Rebecca, great Excellent. idea. Thank you. Um, next up is policy and Dale Harrington. Yes, um, I have uh, greatly reduced uh, the amount I'm going to be commenting on just for the sake of time here. But uh, I want to point out at the outset that uh, this is a policy committee report that's uh, a, a result of the work of the five fabulous people that uh, participate in discussions on our committee, four board members and Tim, the five fabulous. Um, the, the first uh, policy is a uh, consider approving revised policy 601.2 Rossmore News editorial policy as recommended by the policy committee. And this is the first reading. Um, so at its July 12 meeting, the committee made extensive revisions to the policy as most people probably know, um, additional um, uh, recommended revisions were made <clears throat> during the August 13 and September 13 meetings. The committee has proposed changes that will provide more clarity for the senior editor of the news about what should and should not be published. Uh, this proposed policy is being presented to the board of directors for two readings uh, prior to a vote. The second is policy six, I'm sorry, 501.0. Dale, it's, Dale, could I stop you there and just see if anybody has any questions on that oh, first reading? I'm sorry, yes. I, I see that Ann Peterson is here to help answer those if there are any questions. Okay, I don't see any. So uh, thank you. The second, <clears throat> second is uh, a consider approving revised policy 501 installation of signs on Golden Rain Foundation property as recommended by the policy committee. And it was deferred August 26. Um, so all requests for installation of signs or plaques on property under the control of the Golden Rain Foundation shall require the prior approval of the Board of Directors in order to ensure that such signs are in harmony with the general Rossmore setting. Um, so any new personally named sign, uh, trails, I'm sorry, um, created after January 1, 2022 will require board approval. Um, the proposed policy will have two readings before the board, and this is the second reading. Any questions concerning that one? I see Rebecca has a comment. Yeah, um, so when you originally discussed this policy, I thought that we were writing an exception for plaques on benches in GRF parks. Um, I'm happy to go through the board, you know, every time somebody requests to donate a bench and a plaque, um, but I don't know if that's, you know, really worth your time. So I just wanted to clarify if that's the process or if that um, just somehow got left out. Uh, Tim, uh, would you care to, to respond to that? Because I know that, uh, that, that you, Tim, have certain uh, uh, freedoms uh, to make decisions also. Yeah, Rebecca, I don't remember that. I don't remember that being adopted into the policy. So if that's something that you want um, to exclude from consideration for signage, then it's this policy should go back to the policy committee and, and that language should be inserted. Okay. Sounds, sounds, like, like, sounds like something we should do. Send yeah. it back. Okay. Okay, good. Thank you. And the uh, third and final policy is a consider approving new policy 201.7, 
resident advisory committee term limits policy as recommended by the policy committee and it was deferred August 2026. Um, the proposed policy, well, this is the second reading of this policy and for the sake of time, the policy is available for anyone and everyone to read. Uh, so um, I make a, uh, I therefore make a motion that policy 201.7 be adopted. We've had our, we've had our required readings. Do we have a second? Okay, Carl seconds. Any discussion? Seeing none, a roll call vote, please. Certainly. Walker? Yes. Yes. Oh. I'm sorry, did you, what did you say? Did you call my name? Yes. yes. Okay. Hamaji? Yes. Hurt? Yes. Bentley? Yes. Brown? Yes. Blair? Yes. Harrington? Yes. Madaraki? Yes. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, uh, anything else, Dale? Whoops, sorry, I, I muted myself. No, that's it, thank you very, very much. Okay, Paul, I see you have a hand up. Uh, yes, when you asked uh, for questions about the uh, Rossmore News policy, was that the time that you had provided to make comments on that? Or, you know, I, I was just assuming that uh, Dale was presenting it and there would be time for uh, comments on this proposed policy after that. So we, we can certainly now take- the time. Sure, you bet. Okay. Uh, you know, the only thing that I have a problem with is number nine, um, you know, trying, to, this has been a very tortured process in my mind. Um, it's gone through three, four, five, probably more meetings about how we're going to do, how we're going to accept people's um, perspectives about things that may or may not be, well, especially controversial pro uh, um, issues. And um, the alternative voices um, proposal, you know, it bothers me. I don't, I don't think that there is anything in Rossmore that doesn't touch the world or that the world doesn't touch Rossmore. And to try to, you know, um, to try to look the other way and keep these things from being debated and considered and thought about and discussed by the Rossmore community, you know, I think is just shirks our responsibility to provide a forum in which these things can be talked about. Um, and so, I, I'm not in favor of limiting those voices. And um, as, as long as we, you know, as long as they are, um, have some basis in fact that they're not libelous, that we're not talking about personalities and persons, you know, but we stick to the, to the, the issues at hand. We have over 200 clubs in Rossmore. And those 200 clubs probably talk amongst themselves and in the greater community about the whole panoply of things that there is in this world. And for us to try to limit those things, I think is, is um, we, we shouldn't be doing that. We shouldn't be trying try to be the arbiters of those kind of things. And, and so um, I, I can't support number nine in the way that it is written. And my only other edit uh, for this is I noticed that the, the word um, 
in the first paragraph, it says that the Rossmore News is published every Wednesday afternoon. I suggest we drop the word afternoon and just say Wednesday. <laughs> With that, I'm, I'm finished. Carl? Yes, I kind of agree. I think number nine gives the editors an unequal footing with the rest of the residents. And I think that either we provide something, a forum where every resident has an equal voice or else we eliminate the subject of politics, which tends to be a sticky issue anywhere. So I kind of agree with Paul that, you know, this really doesn't frame the thing properly. Uh, Dale? Well, I'm wondering, uh, Dwight, uh, is this is this going to be coming back to the policy committee at our next meeting? I think that's up for the uh, for the board to uh, to weigh in on that. Because mm -hmm. this is a second reading, as I yeah. recall. No, no it's uh, the first. This is the first. Oh, no, I'm reading. sorry. This is the first right. first reading. Um, but if it has to come back then the next time around, it would be the first reading over again. That's so, right. um, and so if I, I would just make a, a brief uh, request that if it's going to come back to the policy committee, if uh, both Paul and Carl could provide some brief thoughts to us on this so that that would help us at the uh, committee meeting. Okay, Kathleen. Um, yeah, I just wanted to, since I'm on the planning committee, to sort of clarify, I don't think that um, we're saying in this policy that people can't comment on world affairs as long as it, it has some relevance to the people here. So if you're talking about something that has nothing to do with the United States, then, um, you know, that's uh, off limits, but I don't think I think this is reframing things, but I don't think it's limiting um, because we're allowing anyone to uh, write in one of the columns and reply to any of the columns. And it only just to have, has to have some relevance to the people here and world affairs often do. So I think it does need to go back to the um, committee if there's been more discussion from these other directors uh, and we can look at it again in the planning committee. And, and actually policy committee, but you're right, Kathleen. Uh, Anne, yes. I just want to Anita. clarify for both Paul and Carl, the way that the current policy is written, the GRF president is the one who is allowed to make the final call on what's published. Right now, the only politics that are allowed in the Rossmore News are in the Republican perspective or the progressive view. That means as you write it, based on how Dwight has decided to define that column is limited to Rossmore affairs, senior living and personal stories. So there is not another avenue for other political views in the newspaper right now. So what the policy change is doing is allowing a third column that basically could encapsulate all of those other political views. It doesn't just constrain it to Republicans and Democrats. So I just wanted to point that out so it's clear. Thank you, Ann. Neva? Also, I don't see anything in number nine that, res that's, that restricts what you can comment on. So I, I'm sort of baffled about why um, Carl and Paul think that it does. Hmm. I mean, I don't see where it says you can't comment on world affairs in there. In yes, the that, that's, that's true, Neva. I have to say that you're right. I, I guess I was, you know, I, I know the background to this whole, right. um, to, to this issue. And that is the difference between how Bob Kelso was interpreting things and permitting them and how Dwight has chosen to um, pull back on that, shall we say, liberal view. And um, 
you know, I guess in a sense, you know, we're, we're, we're censoring Dwight's ability to censor, <laughs> um, which, which I don't like either because it's, it's, we don't need to be setting up barriers, you know, that people will take exception to. And, and that's the, um, that, that's what I'm trying to fight against. Uh, Kathleen? So I think the, um, the policy tries to make clear um, that it's not Dwight who gets to interpret the policy of what goes in the paper. He only gets to, and uh, this would apply to Anne and Dwight as president, that <clears throat> they need to decide if the material follows the policy that the policy committee has um, written. So um, I, I think in the past, they got to sort of take a little more liberalness uh, with what the policy would be. And with this, the way it's written is they only get to decide if it follows the policy that the committee and the board have decided on. And, um, and I think that's the, really the correct way to, to handle uh, what goes into the paper. Okay, Dale? Yeah, uh, uh, Kathleen makes excellent points. And so uh, my, uh, my, my position is we should leave nine alone. Um, and if it's a matter of just changing the first wording in the first paragraph to just say every Wednesday, that wouldn't need to come back to the policy committee, I don't think. Would it, Tim, that, that adjustment could be made and it, this could still be in the first reading? No, I don't think so. I, I, I mean, if, if, if there's, so let me clarify. If there are no other changes to the policy and the only thing the board right now is interested in is removing that afternoon limitation, you could do that with the board with an amendment to the policy as it's written right here, right now doesn't have to go back to the policy committee unless a board member objects and feels that it should be deliberated, you know, and, and more extensively. This is a fairly nominal change. I don't think it really affects anything. I am right. sure that the reason that was put there was because there were probably residents who were the old policy probably said on Wednesdays, the paper will be delivered. And then residents were expecting that when they woke up in the morning, the paper would be on their doorstep. So that's probably why that language was inserted there years ago. Um, if, if you remove it, you're going to end up with that kind of comment at some inevitably at some point. So, it, but it's up to you. If you feel you want to do that, you could do that right here, right now, if that's the only change. To make the changes that Paul was suggesting, that should go back to the policy right. committee if that, because if, that's of substance in a, enough that uh, it should be deliberated at, at length by by residents, at, you know, that's a significant change to the policy. Right. Well, as a result of Paul's comments uh, after um, um, uh, after Kathleen made her statement, my assumption, and correct me if I'm wrong, Paul, my assumption was that the issue is no longer a, con uh, a, 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 a serious issue for you. I would say that's probably true. Okay, so what we're dealing with then, as you point out, Tim, is just a, a brief uh, change uh, in the wording for Wednesday. Well, oh, Dale, before we go there, Carl also had a problem with paragraph nine. Uh, so, Carl, are you okay with the current wording or do you want it to uh, go back? I'm very mixed because I think it gives writers of the progressive Republican and progressive view, Earth Matters and Alternative Voices, a different standing than other residents. And this bothers me. I don't know what the solution is uh, other than to maybe eliminate the idea of, of uh, national and state politics and keep it to Rossmore only politics. Uh, I'm not sure what the other solution is. I know that there are a lot of people that love 
and a lot of people that hate those particular columns. Anne, I see you have your hand up. And then Nita. I just wanted to clarify for Carl, the alternative voices is open to all residents. There is, it's not tied to a club. It is not con contained. So any, but any resident who wants to write for that column and has a political view could do so. Okay, uh, Neva, you had a comment. Anne was very, um, explained very well that it is open to everybody. I see no language in here that restricts it to, you can't comment on world affairs or restricts it to, uh, it only has to be about national affairs. There's no restrictions in there like that in the wording. Okay, so uh, Carl and Paul, do you want to propose changes and send it back to the policy committee or can we move forward, Carl? I think we can move forward. Paul, are you okay with that? Yes, I, okay. I think we can move forward. Okay, okay. Any other comments? Okay, all right, thank you. Um, so we do, uh, based on what Tim said, we do need a, a motion, I guess, uh, to modify that wording in the first paragraph and it could stay here as the first reading then. Or, okay. or you could leave it, you know, I'll, or you could just leave the word afternoon in. It doesn't, it's really insignificant. I, I just noticed it and I chuckled when I read it. Okay. <laughs> right. <laughs> mine, was, mine was delivered yesterday at 10.30 a.m. So I said, no, no, I can't get it yet. <laughs> right. Are we ready to move on? Okay, then we will. Uh, let's tackle uh, some new business, and then my stomach is growling. Uh, Rebecca, did you want to talk to us about the media? Yeah, Perfect. sure. Uh, very quick background. So I, most of you probably recall that we uh, approved a uh, the conversion of some of the lawn in the median on Rossmore Parkway next to Creekside Clubhouse. Um, of course, that area is still sort of under negotiation, depending on what happens with the pickleball courts. Uh, so we've been on hold with that project and I spoke briefly with Tim and he suggested, you know, maybe we move it to a different area so we can continue progress. Um, so we adapted the proposal. The price has gone down because the overall area has gone down. Um, so the proposal is to convert about 7,500 square feet of lawn to drought tolerant landscaping. And it will get us an East Bay mud rebate of between $11,000 and $15,000 and will save us 122,000 gallons of water per year, as well as 750 pounds of chemical fertilizer and herbicide per year. The new cost is down from 57,575 to 41,230, but we're asking for a contingency in case we come across any unforeseen circumstances. So the request on the table is to accept the adapted proposal of 41,230 along with a 20% contingency. And this money has been budgeted for, it's, it's in the budget. Okay, comments, questions? Kathleen, oh, and then Tim. Um, I'll just make the motion that we accept the um, $41,230 plus a contingency for the median conversion. I'll second. I second. Uh, Tim? I just, I was hoping to get this in before a motion was made. Um, so what you're doing, you've already approved the previous allocation of funds. So what we're, the, so the motion, what the motion should say is that you're rescinding the, the earlier authorization and replacing it with this one. Because it's not in addition to the one you've already authorized. This one's replacing it. And then when, if and when a decision is made about Creekside, then you know at some point you could decide to move forward with that that median that that's adjacent to the uh, to the pickleball courts there. Okay, Kathleen. Um, shouldn't this just be a separate motion to approve this, and then a separate motion to rescind the other one? Uh, I don't think it needs to be all in one. You could do it either way. Okay. So there's a, do you feel like amending your motion, Kathleen, or you don't want to do that? 
you know, what do you want to do? Uh, I can amend it. Um, Let's we do that. Placing the other one, that's fine with me. Okay. All right. Mary, do you agree with that? I, yes, I do. Okay. And Deborah, you've got that, I think. Okay. Uh, any discussion? So, Rebecca, a question, uh, a couple things actually. The East Bay mud rebate, that, that's a marvelous thing. <laughs> the dollars that you're saying that we need to spend are not net of that rebate. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah. So, so the total cost of the project will be quite a bit down. Down, right. And, and, and I'm also stunned by the, the savings in water and fertilizer on what seems like a relatively small area. How, how many more areas are there like this where we could get a rebate of that nature, save water and save fertilizer and weed killer? Well, there are a lot. So this project in particular is for all of the medians on Rossmore Parkway, which was originally identified by an ad hoc committee on, I think, irrigation technology a couple of years ago. And so the one we did outside of the gate was unrelated, but it's a very similar type of project. Once you cross into the gate, there are two more medians, smaller ones, and then the one that we're gonna convert right now, which specifically is between Terra California and Sackland Indian. Um, I'm sorry, between, yes, yeah, Terra right. California and Sackland Indian. The one we had originally proposed was between Stanley Dollar and Sackland Indian. Um, so, you know, this is sort of the third out of four that we'll do, and then we can start to also look at the medians that are along Golden Ring Road. Um, trust properties underwent, just before I got here with Rich Perona, a massive lawn reduction project. There is probably still more lawns that can be shaved off, but you're down quite a bit from the amount of lawn that you had, say, 10 years ago. The only limitation for the um, rebates is that you can only get $15,000 worth of rebates every two years, which is really too bad. Right. You'll still realize quite a bit of water savings, um, but this rebate, you know, will not be applicable next year, for example. Um, you know, if we end up with drought, then that could very well change depending on what East Bay Mud decides. But um, yeah, so that, that's the limitation when it comes to the rebate part of it. Got it. Got it. Thank you for that. Dale? Uh, uh, Rebecca, does the rebate amount, is, is it based on the size of the median? So a larger median would be a larger rebate than a smaller one? That's correct. In particular, this is a new rebate called a super rebate, where they're offering more money if you convert medians or if you convert something to California native plants. In this case, we're obviously converting a median. So we're getting $1.50 per square foot of lawn removed. Um, and then you can get more money if you convert irrigation to something more efficient. And we will be doing all that. So it's likely that we will get that entire $15,000 rebate. Um, but depending on you know, what kind of revisions we have to make for irrigation or whatever else, it may be slightly less. Okay, that's good news. Any other comments, discussion? All right, Deborah, I think we're ready for a vote. Certainly. Walker? Yes. Stoneville? Yes. Hamaji? Yes. Hart? Yes. Bentley? Yes. Brown? Yes. Clarity? Yes. Harrington? Yes. Mataraki? Yes. Unanimous. Great. Thank you. Rebecca, keep bringing those rebates to us. We love <laughs> okay, in uh, 2024, I'll bring you the next uh, Yeah, I guess you're right. <laughs> All right. Um, you know, I've heard that it's best to tackle budgeting on a full stomach. So let's take a half an hour break and be back at one o'clock. All right. All right, are we ready for the fun part? Oh, yes. All right, we've, we've, but we've lost a hundred of our, our participants. I'm disappointed, but, uh, but this is the exciting part. And uh, uh, we're gonna talk about approving the proposed operations budget for 2022. Uh, Joel, Tim, who wants to take this show? Do Mary? I, I yes. can make the motions. I can go ahead and make the motions and then we discuss. And it, it was their seconded. We can basically uh, have the discussion. Okay. Or is there any background information we want to provide before we get to that? Joel? Mary? 
<clears throat> so yeah, so I could I could present I could share the screen with respect to the components of the coupon and and the elements that <clears throat> that we're going to be talking about if that's beneficial. That would be great. Yes, please. Okay, can you see the screen? Yes. Okay. So uh, yeah, so in summary, uh, the coupon amount of three fourteen oh six was <clears throat> uh, was originally presented. There was a series of new programs uh, that was discussed at the joint meeting, um, and then uh, at the lower portion of the schedule were the various adjustments uh, that was discussed at the joint meeting and on Tuesday's finance committee meeting. So uh, the proposed coupon at this point is the 30857. And uh, Mary is going to uh, essentially make the motions that essentially summarize the schedule at this point. Okay. And Mary, before you do that, if, if I could just say, Joel, Amanda, Tim, your entire management team, you know, you guys did an amazing job, a thorough uh, examination look at, at expenses for 2022 and put together that very informative uh, budget booklet. Really appreciate that. Any resident who has, a, has more questions, uh, please go back to the September 14th and 15th uh, YouTube. Uh, you can uh, enjoy many hours of uh, budget discussions um, and, uh, or take a look at Simbly and, and view the booklet that was put together. So this is the culmination of all that work and, and appreciate all that you guys have done. Tim? Thanks, Dwight. So before we make motions, um, Joel, I think you were gonna talk about this, but I, I just, before Mary jumped in with motions, I wanted to clarify what the finance committee had recommended. Uh, as you see on this chart here on the screen, this is what you discussed at the, um, the two-day meeting we had earlier this month. Um, but last week, uh, so you see line number 39, which is surplus allocated to reduce the cable TV increase. Um, let me explain what you looked at before. Um, in the number up above, the 314.06 on line 21, that number included um, a reduction that we were anticipating for, I'm sorry, it, it includes the cable TV. And so what we expected, and as we talked about at the earlier meeting this month, was that we, you know, uh, Comcast has to notify us by September 1st each year as to what the amount of the cable TV increase will be for the following year. And as I discussed at the earlier meeting, and, and what, what, I forget the date, September 12th or whatever it was, we hadn't received notice yet. But I, you know, we also know that the, the Postal Service can be slow. And so if they did get something in the mail and it was postmarked by September 1, we would have to honor it. So we didn't. The month went through, went by. And then last week, um, or maybe it was earlier this week, we got notice from Comcast that they intend to raise the rate. So the contract allows them to raise the rate up to 4% per year. Um, they haven't increased the rate since we um, signed up with them for this renewal. But there was an adjustment in 2019 because they removed Turner Classic Movies from the package that we had. And it isn't just for Rossmore. It's the whole country. They removed the Turner Classic Movie station from the what we, we were on, what was called the digital preferred package of Comcast. So when they removed that, there was an uproar here in Rossmore and residents demanded us to get it back. So uh, the only way to get it back was to negotiate a new price with them because they moved Turner Classic Movies into what they call the sports entertainment package. In order to get that, the retail price is $10. The board, we negotiated it, we went back and forth with, with Comcast and they agreed to give it to us at their cost, which is $2.20. So uh, in, 20, in October of 2019, two years ago, uh, we, we re reached that deal with them. The board approved that deal. Then um, 
but they never build us. So we signed a contract. We have a, we're, we're accruing it on the books, but they've never yet sent us the bill for that. Then when we got this new notice of an increase, a 4% increase based on the original $55, it um, wasn't clear whether it was the renewal, the annual renewal, or whether they were billing us for that retroactive for um, $2.20 from 2019, because the amounts are coincidentally exactly the same number. So because the notice came late, it was dated September 17th, and it, it, we received it, I think it was September 23rd. And then it was effective January, I think, 25th. It, then there was a question as to whether this was the annual billing or whether it was the retroactive billing from 2019. So um, on top of that, they are limited in our contract to increasing the Comcast rate by how much the rate outside of Rossmore increases for a plan called the digital starter plan. That was the old plan we were on, on prior to 2017. And when we re renegotiated the contract, um, we kept in that language, still linking it to the whether, whether, whether or not the rate for Walnut Creek consumers outside of Rossmore have an increase in their digital starter plan or not. And that's a published rate. That's a rate that they have to get approved by the city of Walnut Creek in order to, to charge it to people. So uh, I told them when we got the notice that a few things were wrong with it. One, they missed the annual notification date by, by three weeks. Um, it's not clear. And depending on what their answer is from their legal team, then we'll have our legal team evaluate it. It's not clear whether they could implement an increase after the first of the year. The way the language is written, and I, know, I can tell you the intent of the language, was that by notifying us by September 1, that's so that we could know how much to include in the budget each year and, and, and build that then into the following year's coupon. And if it comes at any other date, obviously, there's less and less of an ability for us to do that, especially if, if, if it comes after, say, this meeting here at the end of September, because the mutuals have to have their coupon amount by October one, because they have to work our number into their budgets, and then those budgets have to go out by November one. So that's how how and why the timing here is important. So I, I put Comcast on notice that we were rejecting their increase. Um, they've got a few hoops to run through, so they're going to have to demonstrate to us that the rate outside of Rossmore for the digital starter package increased by at least 4%. Now, just so you know, the digital starter package is the introductory package for, for consumers in Walnut Creek outside of Rossmore. So it's unlikely that that rate moves very much because they wanna get you in as a consumer and then they wanna you know, sell you add-on products and services later once they get you in. So they have not yet provided that to me. So I don't know whether or not the rate for Walnut Creek residents for the digital starter package went up or not. If it did not go up, then there's no question that there will not be an increase in the Comcast rate for next year because it's very that, that language is very clear in the contract. So again, the, 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 if they can demonstrate that it went up by any amount, then they, can, they have the option of raising the rate to us by that amount, and it's capped at 4%. So if it goes up 6%, they're capped at 4%. If it goes up 2%, they're capped at 2 If it goes up 0 then there's no increase in our rate. So, so that's how we set this, this uh, contract up back when it was negotiated in 2017. And, um, but they did you know, give us notice that they intended to increase the rate. So because of that, then it brings us back here to what you see on your screen. So um, the $183,000, that's, that's $2.29. That's, that's the, the increase plus some the taxes that they charge. So um, the, the, I described all this to the finance committee on Tuesday, and they decided that, and it was my recommendation, that if, if Comcast does demonstrate that they can have an increase, and if, if our lawyer 
legal team agrees that it can be implemented after the first of the year, at some date after the first of the year, as long as they give us 120 days notice, then we have to build this into the coupon. So, so it's built up in the number above on line 21, the 31406 includes the Comcast amount. And then what we talked about at, at, at early September with the finance committee and the board together was that because they had not given us notice, we thought we could save that $2.29. So we deducted it from that coupon calculation up above. And that's why you see it shown on line 39 as a negative number. So it's being re reduced from the coupon tally from above. But because they've given us notice and there is a chance that if they did raise the rate and by at least 4% outside the gate, then our rates may go up. So therefore we have to put it back into the budget or leave it into the budget. But what, if you remember back in early September when we all met with the finance committee, the board and the committee were interested in keeping the coupon increase at 6% or lower. So you see the number on line 45 showing 5.99%. So what the finance committee ended up voting on was transferring an additional $183,463 from the surplus, uh, the super surplus that we're expecting for the, for the year 2021 and using that to, um, to keep the coupon at you know, basically 6%. If we don't do that, then the coupon will go up by an amount greater than 6% because you have to then remove line 39 from the schedule, which would then inflate line 45 and make that a larger number. It was, I think it was $310 and 86 cents, I think was the number. So, um, so I just needed to give you that background before Mary makes her motions, just so you understand what's happening with Comcast and the surplus. Um, you also remember when we talked in early September that we anticipate that the surplus number is going to be in the neighborhood of about $3.7 million. That includes uh, roughly $3.6 million in forgiveness for, from the, um, uh, the PPP, the Paycheck Protection Program loan from the federal government. So, um, so you will have another discussion later uh, I think Dwight had, had said he wanted to wait till the audit was concluded for next year before determining how much of the, or what, what you should be doing with the balance of the unallocated surplus. So what we're proposing here then is that we use 315,000, this is on line 38 on the schedule on the screen, 315,000 for um, uh, the increase in the trust maintenance reserve that we need in order to keep the coupon relatively level for the next 10 years for the portion attributable to trust maintenance expenses, because there's, there's, there can be wild swings in those costs from year to year. And when there's a wild swing dramatically going up and then dramatically going down, you have a large increase in the coupon in one year. And then the next year, you might even have a reduction or at least it will go up a smaller amount. So the recommendation that we talked about earlier this month was that you allocate 315000 of the surplus um, to the trust maintenance reserve to cushion future increases that might occur in trust maintenance expenses. And then 183000 of that surplus to be used to offset the, the expected cable TV increase. And then 40000 which was the number, it was just a plug number to get the coupon so that it was at limited to a 6% increase. Um, so Joel, if you remember in, uh, earlier this month, he went through several iterations to try to find that number because the board and finance committee had expressed interest in keeping it at 6%. So those are the adjustments to the coupon on line 21 that you, that you discussed uh, earlier this month. And then the adjustments that you also discussed in lines 25 through 34. Um, or the dollar twenty three on line thirty two. Those are the adjustments you discussed also earlier this month at the at the budget meeting, and then these final adjustments starting on line thirty eight are the three that I just talked about in using surplus monies um, for to help offset portions of this coupon. So, in other words, we've got uh, what is it about five roughly uh, well five hundred thirty eight thousand of of surplus 
that we're of the 3.7 that we're expecting that we're using for for budget purposes the balance and the and the final number will be determined once the audit is done the balance you will then have to decide what to do with that amount next year and whether that's a refund whether that's uh, you know, a further reduction in the coupon or however, you, or, or or allocations to other, you know, capital needs or whatever you, you have the ability to make that decision as to how best to use that money. So, um, so with that, then I'll turn it back either to Joel or to Mary to, to carry, to go on. Before we do that, I see Paul has his hand up. <laughs> All that being said, um, the the increase for the new sports entertainment package and uh, redoing of the of the contract as a result of that could mean that you know, first of all the first question is can they still bill us for that is that still a dual a yeah. A, a, Okay. Yeah, they, so, can, they can bill us because we signed a contract to that effect in October of 2019. Okay. So, so that yet they can bill us for that, and they should bill us for that. We've been accruing it; we just haven't paid it because they haven't billed us. So it's not. There's not going to be an economic hit to us, a greater hit for that two dollars and twenty cents. Okay. The question nice. here is whether this new increase was that, or whether it's the four percent that the contract allows for next year. Um, so, really, what's at play here? The coupon already in include the coupon that we have right now anticipated that we would be paying that two dollars and twenty cents from the, the sports and entertainment package. That already is is anticipated because we've been accruing it. So that's already built into the 2021 coupon. So all we're talking about here is the increase that they might be proposing for 2022, which coincidentally is also the same number, two dollars and twenty cents. Okay, but if it's built into the 2021 coupon, then is the estimated surplus that we've been reporting 183,463 less than? Um, no, because no, it's remember we we're already accruing it, so we're we're booking an expense every month for that sports and entertainment package okay, at two dollars and twenty cents. So that's not part of the surplus. Correct. Now, if they don't bill us, if they if they decide to forgive that, then we will actually have that money come back as additional surplus. But you know, we signed a contract. It, I'm not sure why they haven't billed us. They just haven't got their act together, I guess. Hmm. Okay, what are you a betting man? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's 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 been interesting <laughs> over the years here. Um, I believe that the, the the contract that we had prior to the one we're in right now, uh, I I can't remember if it was a three year deal or a four year deal, um, and so that's the one I inherited when I first got here. And in in those years prior, they only increased it once in all those years during that contract. This contract that we've been in since 2017, they haven't increased it, other than the sports entertainment thing, which was a kind of a separate deal. They have the they have the right under the contract to remove or add channels at their discretion. And that happens, there's, there's, no, there's no cable service anywhere that would guarantee that you can get a channel um, because they, they're in, in negotiations with the content providers for the rates. And you read yeah. about that in the newspaper all the time. You know, There's yeah. always disputes with cable companies and, and the suppliers of content, whether they're networks or whether they're you know, Netflix or whomever is, is providing the content. So um, they will never guarantee that you will get the channels that you have on the day you sign up. They will, they will never agree to that. So that's, that is not an option. There's residents who feel that we should be insisting on that, but I can tell you that, they, that that is not an option. We tried to push that. That is just simply not something they can do because they can't be assured that they will always get the content from the content owners. Comcast doesn't own all the content. They own NBC and all that content on NBC, all the affiliated NBC stations, but they don't own ABC. They don't own CBS. They don't own ESPN. They don't own any of that other stuff. So they're at the whim and the mercy of their negotiation teams with those content providers. And so um, that's why when, uh, Turner Classic Movies, I guess they were in a dispute with them a few a couple years back, and Turner had raised the rates so much that 
uh, Comcast said we can no longer continue to provide that in in the digital preferred package, and so they removed it. And again, not, that was not just targeting Rossmore. That was every di digital preferred package that they offered in the United States. They removed it from that that lineup. So everybody, if you wanted Turner any longer, you had to get it from the from the sports entertainment package, which is ten dollars a month that we're getting for two dollars and twenty cents, which they haven't billed yet billed us for, but we've been accruing. So okay. there will not be an additional hit for that 220 unless they forgive it and then it'll come back to us as a as a credit to our bottom line. Okay, that's that's a relief. Thank you. Okay. So Kathleen, you have a question? Yeah. So um, in here, this doesn't list the percentage increase of the coupon from last year. At the budget meeting, we had talked about uh, limiting it to 6%, but then this business with the additional Comcast, and I thought the decision was to keep it at 6%. Yes, it is. And so this is this reflects 6%. Yeah, on line 45, you can see in column P, right where Joel has the cursor. Okay. Paint it. Thanks. Okay, any other comments before we get to Mary? Mary, what do you have for us? First, thank you, President Walker. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Joe. I move that we approve the GRF operations budget for 2022 in the aggregate amount of $25,160,050 for a coupon amount of $314.06 per manner per month, which includes cable TV and internet service. Do we have a second? I second it. Tim? So let, let me, I should have explained this to how we do this process, because I know some of you are new to this. So the way this works is the treasurer makes the motion for the original budget amount that was presented to the community back in early September. So that's the line that Joel has highlighted on line 21. And then there are adjustments at, 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 that we went through at the uh, earlier meeting this month. And those are this middle section that he's highlighting right here. Those, those are the adjustments from the new programs or modifications to existing programs that was in that section of your binder for the budget. And so what Mary will do is she's made a motion for the coupon, and then we will then have a series of motions that will amend that coupon amount by these amounts that we have highlighted right here. And we'll go through first this section that Joel has highlighted in gray, and then we'll move down to the lower section on the surplus numbers. And then Mary will make motions for those as well. So then we'll end up with a coupon. Now, board members generally don't disagree with the recommendations. In fact, I don't recall that uh, since I've been here, I don't recall there's ever been uh, a change to these numbers once, because once, you've already gone through the, you spent two days in a budget hearing around this. So you've already walked through this whole thing. But I, I know that the year before I got here, at this meeting, a board member did propose an adjustment to the budget. So if, if there's something critically important that you feel very strongly about, um, this is your last chance. If there is something really critical that you feel strongly about, you can make an, an additional, either a motion or an amendment to a motion um, for anything that's in the budget, not just the things here on the screen, but anything that was in the budget. Um, I, it, it gets very, it gets a little more complicated though, if we start making adjustments now based on things that you've basically already agreed to back in early September. So it just gets, it makes it a little more complicated, but you still do have the right to make further edits to this if you choose. Okay. Any, we have a motion on the floor. Any, any further discussion? All right, Deborah, we're ready for a vote. Um. Sure. I can't, I can't see where to unmute. Let me look here. Okay. You are, you are unmuted, Mary. Thank you. All right. So Walker. Yes. Stumpville. Yes. Amaji. Yes. Hurt. Yes. Bentley. Yes. Brown. Yes. Flaherty. Yes. Harrington. Yes. Amadaraki. Yes. Unanimous. Excuse me, Dwight. Could I just yes. clarify? Was there a second to Mary's motion? I'm, I, I'm Kathleen. Kathleen. Okay, I just wanted to be sure we. Have yes. Yeah. 
Mary, did you have something more? Yes. I move that we amend the main motion to approve the proposed 2022 GR operations budget and recommend approval of a budget increase of $10,150 for the addition of a time and attendance payroll system. We have a second. $52. $10,152. Okay. Thank you, second. Mary. Paul seconded. Any discussion? I, I guess we need to do a roll call again. Okay. Yes. Walker? Yes. Stumfell? Yes. Amaji? Yes. Hurt? Yes. Bentley? Yes. Brown? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Harrington? Yes. Mother Rocky? Yes. Okay, thank you. Mary? I move that we amend the main motion to approve the proposed 2022 GRF operations budget for a budget increase of $3,145 for the addition of a phone recording feature. Do you have a second? Second. Who was that? Paul. Paul, okay. Guy in the any, cloisters. Uh, any discussion? All right, a vote please. Walker? Yes. Dumpel? Yes. Hamachi? Yes. Hurt? Yes. Bentley? Yes. Brown? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Harrington? Yes. Motoraki? Yes. Unanimous. Thank you. Mary? I move that we amend the main motion to approve the proposed 2022 GRF operations budget and recommend approval of a budget increase of $25,100 for the addition of a co-location off-site data backup facility. Okay, do we have a second? Second. I, I didn't see who that was. Deborah, maybe you Neva? got that. That was Neva. Neva. Okay, thank you, Neva. Any discussion? Okay, another vote, Deborah, please. Walker? Yes. Dumpo? Yes. Amaji? Yes. Hurt? Yes. Bentley? Yes. Brown? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Harrington? Yes. And Madaraki? Yes. Gina. Okay, thank you. Mary? I move that we amend the main motion to approve the proposed 2022 GRF operations budget to include a budget increase of $60,525 for the addition of a full-time human resources staff member. Do we have second. a second? Second. Okay. Any comments? We're ready for a vote. Walker? Yes. Stumpel? Yes. Amaji? Yes. Hurt? Yes. Bentley? Yes. Brown? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Harrington? Yes. Mataraki? Yes. Unanimous. Okay, thank you. Mary? I move that we amend the main motion to approve the proposed 2022 GRF operations budget uh, uh, by allocating a portion of the projected 2021 surplus in the amount of $315,000 to increase the trust maintenance reserve and remove a corresponding amount from the operations budget. Second. So a question about that. <laughs> I still don't. So, so we're going to remove that from the budget and then increase the budget next year, or we're ju we're just allocating a portion of the surplus. I, I still fail to understand this part. Joel. So what we're doing is so in the coupon number on line twenty one, we had uh, Joel help me with the number. It was seven hundred and something thousand in in trust maintenance reserve. Uh, uh, trust yeah. maintenance expenses, I should say. And uh, 300 and I think it was 385,000 of it, um, it are actual expenditures that we have in uh, forecasted for this year. And but on the on the long range forecast that we have for trust maintenance expenses for the next 25 years. Um, and I think what we shared with the with the board and the finance committee was I, th I think it was a 10 year projection. 
it showed that in order to keep the coupon stable for the fluctuations in the trust maintenance expenses, we needed to fund the trust maintenance reserve in an amount at $700,000 a year for the next like 10 years. And by doing that, it keeps this, that particular line item in the budget stable. Um, and then what happens is in those years when the annual expenditures are in excess of 700,000, you, you don't increase the coupon for that extra amount. You draw from the reserve that you've, that you've built up and you pay down the amount in excess of the 700,000 against that reserve. So that, that's the idea. So it, effectively what this is doing is it's, it's giving the money back to the residents, but probably in future years, it's, it's smoothing the coupon out because it's the one area of the budget that has significant fluctuations from year to year. Tim, let me interrupt you for a second. So I, I get all that, but what we're okay. doing here by this motion is reducing the budget so that next year there's going to be an automatic increase to get yeah. back to 700000 in the budget. When in reality, all we're doing is just using a part, we're allocating surplus. Well, and, and, and we will against be against the coupon. We will be budgeting that 700000 every year. So um, that will be the line. I, that, that'll be the amount that at least the, the forecast that we have done at this today, looking forward for the next you know, 25 years, for the next 10, it, it needs to be at 700,000. Now, when we, when we, every year we have to analyze this, it could be that when we reanalyze it next year, that the contribution only needs to be 650, or it could be that the contribution has to be 800,000. Who knows? We don't know today what that might be, but our forecast today looks like given the current inflation rates, given the current expenditure, you know, estimated expenditure costs for replacements of the various components uh, or the work that would need to be done, that 700,000 each year will be the right amount to put into the, on this line item in, in each of the successive budgets for the next 10 years. So, but like I say, it can, it can change though, given factors from year to year, but uh, it's not gonna, it shouldn't change that, that dramatically. If we had something, like, let's say that there was um, uh, some hey. cataclysmic event that increased our, our expenditures. Um, uh, that would cause us to reevaluate the, um, the cost, uh, the forecasted cost for all these expenditures. And that could change the number. But, you know, it, it really hasn't changed. We, we've kept it at this number now for a, a little while or very close to this number in the forecast. Um, I, I think it. What you don't want, because we lived with this about two or three years ago, we had a really large increase in trust maintenance expenditures when we painted the gateway building. And then we had some uh, siding damage that had to be repaired. There, were, there was some kind of a product. It was like a fiberglass base at the base of gateway all the way around the building. And, and it was original. It was 20 years old and it was failing. Massive cracks were showing up in this fiberglass plating. It looks like it's concrete or it looks like it's plaster, but it's not. And so that year, we, we ended up spending a huge amount on, on both painting and repairing that siding. And so that's what you want to prevent or, you know, uh, caution against because those things that are anticipated, and we knew that, that when I got here in 2015, those cracks were evident on the sides of the buildings and we knew it had to be addressed, but the board waited a couple of years to address it until we just couldn't go any longer because it, it, it allowed water to get behind the panels, which can then affect the substructure of the building. Hey, Tim, Tim, but my, that's not my question. I totally understand maintaining that reserve. My question is, why aren't we just saying we're just using a part of the surplus to reduce the coupon? Because what, what, what I fear is that we're gonna have a budget line item that's gonna be $315,000 that next year has to go up by 315,000. We're just using a part of the surplus. That's all we're saying. Right. That's but, a, but in we, my we, opinion, we, that's what we should be saying. Yeah, what Dwight, what Dwight is saying is, in effect, you're, that line item well, that has this 700,000 is, in effect, 385 right. by using yeah, the if, surplus. If we wanted, if you- So we're, that, not the, making, we're not making the effort that we need to make that you're arguing for very eloquently to keep the trust maintenance amount up at seven hundred thousand. Well, it's your it's your choice. The seven hundred thousand is built into the budget already on line twenty one. It's in there already. 
So if you don't want to fund, if you want to fund only the actual cost, which is three hundred eighty-five thousand. No, Tim, um, no, no. What we're what I'm suggesting, I think Paul is suggesting, is that we fund it at seven hundred thousand, but we we use three hundred fifteen thousand out of the surplus against the coupon. Yeah, that that's what we're doing. That's, that's what this is. I, that's not what the motion was. The motion was to reduce the budget by three hundred fifteen thousand. Project from the projected surplus. It's being allocated to the trust maintenance reserve. Yes. I heard in the motion that we were going to re remove it from the budget. What was your motion, Mary? Let me go again. I move that we amend the main motion to approve the proposed 2022 GRF operations budget and recommend approval of allocating a portion of the projected 2021 surplus in the amount of $315,000 to increase the trust maintenance reserve and remove a corresponding amount from the operations budget. Yep. So it's it's surplus being allocated to this particular line item, just like the surplus is going to be allocated to reduce the cable TV. Well, that, then I just object to removing from the expense line item. I, Joel, I agree with that, but expense removing it from the budget doesn't make sense to me. So we have several other uh, comments, Carl and then Kathleen. Yes, I, I think the issue is, do we put all of the surplus into the reserve budget to increase the reserve so that we can keep the coupon uh, steady? Or are we only moving a portion of the surplus in so that we can decide at a future time how to use the surplus? Because I guess once put in the reserve, it would be harder to take it out of the reserve and use it for other purposes. Is that correct? Well, you, you don't know what the amount of the surplus is yet. So I, I, I think what, what was discussed earlier this month was to wait until the audit number was done before you determine how much uh, of the final number you either want to refund. And I think that was the the interest on the part of the board and the finance committee was to do a refund to the mutuals. Somebody's got a fun ring. Uh, Kathleen? Um, um, so I think I understand the way it's worded and I'm, I think it's perfectly fine. It's saying you're gonna take some money out of the uh, surplus and, and some money that comes straight out of the budget and put it together part so you have a reserve um a bigger reserve in future years so i i think it's worded just fine so joel this is a live spreadsheet right mm -hmm. yes it is just uh erase line 38 and h and j just erase those dollar amounts that um the 393 and the 315 and then so we can see what happens to the coupon so if you don't do this, the coupon goes up 7.34%. So Tim, Tim you, I, 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 I don't know why I can't break through on this. I have no <laughs> problem to using that 315. What I have a problem with is removing it from the budget, removing it from the line item. Allocate surplus. That, that's what we're talking about. Removing it from the budget, then next year we have an automatic increase of 315000 in that budget line item. No. Well, that's what your motion reads, Mary. Okay, that's not the way I was reading it either. Well, read the last couple words. Okay, let's go here. Let's see. Uh, basically, allocating a portion of the projected 2021 surplus in the amount of 315000 to increase the trust maintenance reserve and remove a corresponding amount from the operations budget, which is what this negative is all about. So, uh, yeah, so Dwight, my understanding of this is we're using surplus funds to essentially fund a reserve. So uh, you're right in that next year, if we want to maintain the same reserve and we don't have a surplus to allocate, then this amount is going to reappear back into the coupon. That's right. 
That's so right. let's just look at the line item next year. If we do what this motion says, the line item is going to say a budget of three hundred eighty-five thousand for twenty twenty-two. Twenty twenty-three, right. it'll say seven hundred thousand. Based on the way this motion is worded, no, I have we're still we're but we're still keeping the seven hundred k, but we're funding three fifteen of it with surplus. Yes, <laughs> I, I have a um, a suggested amendment to the motion. Instead of saying, remove a corresponding amount from the operations budget, why don't we say, apply the allocated surplus to that line item in the operations budget? So that way the 700,000 doesn't change, but the 313, the 315,000 gets applied to that 700,000. Joel, does that work from the accounting point of view? Um, from an accounting point of view, certainly. Okay. I don't have an objection to that. So tell me what appears on the line item for trust maintenance reserve for 2022. It's it's still going to be the 700k because we're, we're but we're funding it from the, reserve the reserve portion of that 700k through the surplus. So it's just an allocation of the surplus against the coupon. Exactly. Okay. As long as the budget line item remains at 700,000, I'm okay with that. It will, it will. So are you amending your motion, Mary? We can, I would accept that we, we apply that as opposed to what was the word we used here, approval of allocating a portion of the, uh, let's see, uh, yeah, allocating a proportion of the, to increase the trust maintenance, we'll be allocating from the surplus the amount against the uh, trust fund maintenance. Or Paul, you said it very well. Would you restate how you said it? Sure. I, I just after the word and remove remove a corresponding amount from the operations budget to be to say apply the allocated surplus apply, to the apply, operations. Uh, so budget. change the word remove to apply. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I would be happy. I will restate the uh, motion that way. Okay. And there was there a second on that? I forget. Yes, I seconded. Do you agree to that change, Dale? Yeah, I've been thinking that all along. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> any, any other discussion? Okay, Deborah, I think we're finally ready for a vote. Certainly. <clears throat> Walker? Yes. Stumfill? Yes. Amaji? Yes. Kurt? Yes. Bentley? Yes. Brown? Yes. Clarity? Yes. Harrington? Yes. Mataraki? Yes. Unanimous. Okay, Mary, I think you have at least one more. I do. I move that we one amend more. the main motion to approve the appro approved 2022 GRF operations budget and recommend approval of allocating a portion of the projected 2021 surplus in the amount of $223,436. Is there a second? Add those two together. There you go. Oh. And I think it was $63, not 36, but. 223, 463. 463, thank you. All right, any discussion? Who seconded the motion, please? I did. Kathleen did. Okay, uh, any, any discussion, I'm sorry. I think we're ready for a vote, Deborah. Walker? Yes. Stumpville? Yes. Amaji? Yes. Hurt? Yes. Bentley? Yes. Brown? Yes. Clarity? Yes. Harrington? Yes. Mataraki? No. Okay. Carries. Okay. And Mary, anything hey, more? I'm, <laughs> I make, <laughs> I move that we approve the allocation of other income associated with the forgiveness of the payroll protection plan and interest as follows. Basically, three thousand. It's a the total is three million six hundred eleven thousand five hundred sixty-two dollars and seventy-two cents. Of that, 
3,000, let's see, GRF operations, 3,228,562.72 and 383,000 to MOD. Is there a second? Second. I think that was Paul. Yes. Okay. Carl? Yes, I understand these aren't necessarily the final numbers, and I'm wondering why we're deciding this at this point. So I, I could address that. So, <clears throat> so specifically, this is the PPP loan forgiveness and the interest, which are absolute amounts. So this is not a, a motion to decide how we utilize the surplus. This is a motion to essentially allocate the forgiveness, which is we're required to do by gap. So for generally accepted accounting principles, when the loan is forgiven, we must recognize the other income on our financial statements. So we don't need a motion for that, but we do need a motion to allocate that income between GRF operations and MOD. And what was discussed by the, the, uh, uh, task, uh, the task force was to allocate $383,000 to MOD. So it's a clean approach at this point to recognize the other income what, uh, to MOD. But, but again, this is nothing to do with cash. Right, so the cash decisions are are going to be made after the audit. Does, does that make sense? Okay, so this is purely for accounting purposes. It's not making any commitments in terms of cash dispersal. That is correct. That's right. But but the but but just the the other income will be recognized uh, uh, in the MOD division for 2021 at the $383,000. Tabat. Yes. Okay, any further discussion? Neva? Yeah. And so is the 3,228 also recognized in the operations budget for 2021? That is correct. That will go to GRF operations. Okay. This essentially is the majority, the vast majority of the projected surplus. But this is again a accounting principle that we must adhere to uh, since the loan was forgiven. Okay. If I could add, then the, the three hundred eighty-three thousand is the amount of the loss that MOD incurred last year in 2020. The reason that the task force, uh, which was a task force of the finance committee to evaluate the what to do with surplus, the reason they recommended this is because the Golden Rain Board in March of 2020 decided to continue paying employees once the shutdown happened on March 17th. And, and that shutdown impacted uh, MOD and GRF employees. And uh, GRF's, em or, I'm sorry, MOD's employees are, um, many of them are billable, and which means that they perform services for the community and their time is billed to the receiver of those services. So when there's a plumbing problem or whatever, uh, there's d different things that they can get that they bill their time for. So when the shutdown happened between March 17th and I think it was May 4th of last year, all those employees were still on the payroll, but their time was not being billed out. And that resulted in a loss to MOD of about a half million dollars. A little, I think it was even more than that. And then that was offset by in particular member records, which generally runs a surplus in that department that often offsets shortfalls in other areas of MOD. So the 383,000 makes MOD whole for the year 2020. So all we're doing here is we're saying out of the $3.6 million in loan forgiveness, uh, a, por a portion of which was attributable to the fact that we had MOD employees 
in, in the application for the PPP money. And uh, the task force and the finance committee recommended to you, uh, I think a meeting or two ago, that you do this, that you pass back that 383,000 back to MOD. We have to do this now because this has to be booked before the end of the year. And the MOD needs to know whether or not um, they're, they're, they have to recover that deficit from 2020 um, by, in the form of a higher coupon for the MOD portion of the coupon. So this 383 gives it back to them so they don't have to recover the 2020 loss um, by, in the form of a higher coupon for 2022. So that's what, that's what this exercise does. It, it, all it's doing is it's segregating between, you know, remember MOD and GRF are all part of GRF, but we refer to MOD really as a separate semi-autonomous group that's under the control of the mutuals. And then all the rest of us are in what we call GRF. And um, so this is just delineating how much goes to MOD, makes them whole, then they know they don't have to re recover that 2020 deficit in the 2022 coupon. I hope that thanks, is clear. Thanks. Thanks for the explanation. Also, I think it's important that this uh, entry be booked by the end of September. So that's part of the reason it's on the agenda today. Correct. Right. Any other comments, discussion? All right, Deborah, we're ready for a vote. Certainly. Walker? Yes. Trumpel? Yes. Kamaji? Yes. Hurt? Yes. Bentley? Yes. Brown? Yes. Clarity? Yes. Arrington? Yes. Monaraki? Yes. And okay. point of order. Uh, we need to go back and approve the amended budget. Oh, the or the budget as amended by all the amendments. Absolutely true. And I'll do that. Okay. I move that we approve the budget proposed and amended as amended. Second. Wait, Tim. Tim. Wait, yeah. You want you want to state the budget amount and the coupon amount. Joel, can you okay. put that back up on the screen? I got it. Yes. I move that we approve the amended budget for in the total amount of $24,720,509 with a coupon amount of $308.57. And Paul, did you second that? Certainly. Okay. Any discussion? Another vote, Deborah. Certainly. Walker. Yes. Stemfield? Yes. Hamaji? Yes. Hurt? Yes. Bentley? Yes. Brown? Yes. Clarity? Yes. Arrington? Yes. Mataraki? Yes. Unanimous. Okay, thank you. Paul, thanks for bringing that up. You're welcome. <laughs> and Mary, Joel, everybody, thanks for, we're done with the budget for 2022. Done. Yay. Okay. Uh, Next item, uh, I am going to be turning over the gavel to Kathleen for the next item. But before I do, uh, Kathleen, I understand that a direct member of your family is a member of the tennis club. Do you feel that you can be fair and impartial and working for the best interests of Golden Rain Foundation and its members by taking the gavel at this point in time? Yes, I do. Okay, thank you. The gavel is yours. Okay, so uh, first of all, um, Tim, would you describe the situation? Yeah, so, so uh, we do not have, as I mentioned earlier this morning, uh, on the agenda, any discussion around pickleball yet. You likely will at some point here in the future. But as you know, because we've been getting a lot of correspondence from residents over the last uh, you know, month or so, uh, there's been a lot of very strong opinions uh, around dollar uh, and the area around dollar and wanting to preserve it. And so some of the letter writers and some of the commenters today during resident forum have asked that anybody that has an interest uh, or participates in a club affiliated with pickleball should recuse themselves. Um, 
so we went through that process. Uh, we asked the board members if anybody was a member of the club. Three members identified themselves as members of the pickleball club. So it's President Walker and then direct directors Hamaji and Bentley have all indicated they are currently members of the pickleball club. Then um, in the last couple of weeks, it's uh, in the newspaper and then following the article in the newspaper, it was clear that the Sustainable Rossmore Club was um, sponsoring some of the objections to the um, any looking at the expand, possible expansion of pickleball into the dollar grounds. And so um, uh, President Walker had indicated that if there are members on the board in Sustainable Rossmore, that they should identify themselves. So two directors have, uh, directors Harrington and Mataraki have both indicated they're members of Sustainable Rossmore. And so we have a total of five members that have potential conflicts and they've all submitted statements. They're all included in the board packet um, in terms of their um, involvement in these clubs. So, so the question then here today is, uh, and it, it, so we, uh, let me uh, clarify, Golden Rain Foundation has a policy. It's called the Conflict of Interest Policy. It's 201.2. It's also in your packet. And it requires all board and committee members every year to fill out a conflict of interest statement. And, and they do. And then if there is a conflict, either once a year when that statement is provided or at any other time during the year, the directors, according to the policy, are required to notify the Golden Rain Board that they have a potential conflict. The person can either recuse themselves uh, basically remove themselves from um, any discussion or participation in discussion and then unable to vote on a matter um, voluntarily, or they can say, I have a potential conflict. I'd like the board to evaluate whether this is a conflict or not. Then the board votes to decide whether that, that there's a conflict. The way we normally handle this is that conflicts of interest are normally handled in executive session. Um, but because of the wide interest in this particular topic, President Walker had indicated that he preferred to have this discussion at the open meeting, which is why we're doing it now. So the interesting dynamic to this is that, uh, at least since I've been here in now six years, uh, we've never had more than one person ever identify themselves as a, as a potential with a potential conflict. So we now have five over this over this issue. So it does present some issues, some, you know, potential challenges for us. So I consulted our attorney and uh, spoke with him last night. Um, uh, I've been trying to reach him for a week. He just wasn't able to get back to me. So we did speak late last night and he provided us with some guidance on how to move forward with this. So the, the question here, and I want to make sure it's clear because some of the letter writers that we've seen um, some have intimated that there might be a, a financial interest. I'm not sure what that might be, but they, they seem to hint at that. Um, others feel that it's just a conflict because you're a participant on a club that's that's got a matter before uh, the board for consideration. So after talking about all this with our attorney, uh, the process that we're going to use here today, so Dwight has removed himself as the chair because he's one of the, one of the five members that has a potential conflict, and he's um, a uh, turn the gavel over to Kathleen, who will lead this discussion. And what, will we, what we will do, so you all understand how the process is going to work, is that Kathleen's going to ask if there is anybody who wishes to voluntarily recuse themselves. For whatever reason, whatever your reason might be, you, all you have to say is, I recuse myself on this matter. I'm, I'm not going to be involved in this matter. Then, um, uh, then she's going to ask the entire group whether anyone feels they cannot be fair and impartial working for the best interests of the Golden Rain Foundation, making their decisions. And, and then if the answer is yes, then they would be recused. If there are none, then the directors, uh, she will then ask whether all the directors, she'll ask all of you whether any of you believe that any of your colleagues have a conflict. And if so, you need to state why you think your colleague has a conflict. So in other words, if you disagree with their self attestation as to whether or not there's a conflict, you have the ability to say, no, I, I disagree with you. I think there is a conflict and here's why. And so you get to express that. And then um, let's see. Uh, and then what we will do is we will go through individually 
the five directors that have a potential conflict, each one, the other eight of you will vote whether or not you believe that person has a conflict and should be recused. So that's going to be the process. Kathleen has this written out in front of her, so she's going to walk walk us through that. But I wanted to help you understand what the process is going to be, because this is very unusual. Like I say, I've, I've been here six years. I've not had more than one person at a time ever express uh, an, uh, a conflict. Um, so this is a little unusual to have five directors, which is a majority of the board, potentially remove themselves from all, all discussions on this. The other thing that I would point out, and I put this in your packet, is that I asked uh, some of our longer tenured staff members here in, in over the years and in, in previous discussions around the tennis complex, the table tennis complex, um, the Creekside renovation or the Creekside clubhouse construction, the event center construction, the fitness center renovation, all the various improvements that have been made on the golf course over the years, the annual increases that we typically budget for uh, with golf and the rates. I asked whether any directors historically have, if, if any staff members were aware of any directors recusing themselves from any of those votes. And I was, I've been told, and there's been none that I'm aware of since I've been here. So I was really interested in whether prior to my time during these major construction projects, whether anybody felt a need to, to um, recuse themselves. And what we heard from some of the speakers today was actually, was interesting. There were some who, demanded and insisted that if you have any participation in the club, you should recuse. But you also heard from quite a few people who said, uh, make it very, very difficult to operate Golden Rain if you all had to recuse yourself on the budget, <laughs> right? You all have an interest in the budget and yet you all have to vote on the budget. And there's a compelling interest on of all of yours to keep the coupon as low as it can be. But if you all had to recuse yourself on the budget, we would never have a budget approved every year. So you can take this to the extremes on all of these various items. And, um, but I wanna make sure it's clear that we're not just talking about whether it's a, con a financial con conflict of interest. It is really the question is whether there is not just a financial interest, because it doesn't have to be a financial interest, it could be for any reason. And really the, the greater question at hand is whether the director can be fair and impartial regardless of their club affiliations, whether you can be fair and impartial and act in the best interest of the Golden Rain Foundation. That's the overriding question uh, that you should be evaluating when we go through this exercise here today. All right, so with that, I'll turn it over to Kathleen. Uh, Dwight, you wanna say something? So, so it strikes me that who said being a club member is a conflict of interest? I don't see that in the policy anywhere. We've, we've gotten some accusations from um, some residents, but I, I see nothing that defines a club membership as a conflict of interest. And so, so quite honestly, I, I'm, I'm offended by this conversation that, that our uh, integrity and, and our judgment is called into question because we're members of a club? This is absurd. Well, I think that uh, we, we all are involved in various things. And so if we um, couldn't participate in any discussion about anything that we're involved in, the board would be pretty, um, it would be pretty hard to do anything. So um, let's go through, since this is being a special thing, let's go through um, the steps and um, just to make sure that uh, all the residents feel that we are not making a decision about pickleball um, that is just in our own interest, Any anyone on the board. Ted, did you wanna say something? Yeah, I, I just wanna say I agree with Dwight. This is really offensive to me that we're even going through this because if we start down this road then we are going to get called out on everything that's being done. And we're going to have to have this conversation before every single vote that we are going to do. Uh, you can see on my sheet, an 11C4, there is nothing in Rossmore that I don't touch. I've been here 18 years. I've been involved in everything that's happening around Rossmore, or I'm affiliated with a person who is doing something that I'm not doing, such as... I know five people who play Mahjong all the time. I do not play, but they talk to me about it all the time. So if we're going to make a new clubhouse for the Mahjong players, 
I won't, I'm going to get called out again. And this is an insult on my integrity. And I'm totally offended by we're, us doing this. And if we do it today, we're going to have to do it for every vote going forward. Um, so are you saying you object to doing this now? Should we um, vote on whether we should go ahead with this discussion? Um, I'm saying that this is going to be an issue going forward with anybody who doesn't like something that the board has to make a decision on. Take water reclamation coming up. That's going to be a big thing. That's going to be costing a lot of money and there's going to be a lot of input on that. And yet that only is for the golf course as of right now. That's to help offset the water costs at the golf course is something that's really good for Rossmore if we can figure out how to make the thing work out. Yet, I play golf three times a week. I'm on the golf advisory board. So we're gonna have to do this again from the people who will come up because it was brought up now, you're gonna have to do this again because they're gonna say, we need to know that these people are doing, you know, are, are not thinking about themselves and they're thinking about what is better for Rossmore. Well, um, I, you know, I have to say, I think that um, if we go through this now that the residents will see, um, assuming that everyone um, doesn't recuse themselves, that we are all of us acting in the interest of, the, of all of GRF. And so I don't think we would have to repeat this every, every time an issue comes up. But I, not, I think we should covering. go ahead and do it. We're not covering everything that everybody's involved in. You're only covering two specific Thanks. areas. So this will have to come up again for every area that comes up that we're gonna be doing something with in the future. And I think that this is not a good path to go down. Um, so let me ask all of the directors, um, um, how many of you feel that we should not be having this discussion? Raise your hand. So one, two, three, four, five, five uh, out of nine. So that is a majority. So uh, Tim. So the reason this is here, as I said, was because quite a few residents have brought this up. And when this started to become kind of a campaign, it was clear that it was a campaign because a lot of the language was identical from writer to writer. Um, that's when I consulted our attorney and I asked the attorney exactly that question. Uh, is this reasonable? Is this something that we need to do? You know, I, we talked about the history. There hasn't been uh, directors historically that have recused themselves. Uh, now, you could probably come to your own conclusions about whether you were an officer of the club and whether that would be appropriate. If you're an officer of the club and a director of GRF and, the, and you have a club matter before consideration for the board, probably that's a conflict. I mean, I, it's not for my, it's not my decision, it's your decision, but that would, I think, probably clearly be a conflict. But the attorney had, had said that, um, that he, he felt that this is, that this should be discussed. If residents are bringing this up, your membership is bringing this up and quite, not just one person or two people, but probably several dozen have commented on this already. Um, so he, he felt that this should be brought out you know, and discussed as a potential conflict. You doesn't mean that by having the discussion that there is a conflict. Um, and certainly, you know, I can, I can understand why all, all of you would be offended by this. If you have a conscience and you've always operated in the best interest of the Golden Rain Foundation, um, it, it would be upsetting to think that people would think that you couldn't operate for the best and continue to operate for the best interest of the community, even if you participated in one of these activities or clubs. So um, the question of recusal is a question that has to be voted on by the board. Now you can decide not to move forward with this if you want, uh, but understand that there will be a lot of feedback from the community on that and that's your prerogative. Um, you know, Generally when our attorney tells us or strongly recommends that we do something, it, my advice has always been to follow the attorney's advice just to keep you out of legal trouble. 
So uh, uh, what I, I suggest is, is that I could just ask if anyone um, of the directors wishes to recuse, recuse themselves because they feel that they cannot um, be impartial um, and working for the best interest of the uh, of GRF. How about if I just ask that, ask for any volunteer who would want to because they don't feel they can be impartial and that be um, all that we do today. Or Tim, or do you think we really need to go through all of it for, for the legal side of it? I'm, I'm not an attorney, so I'm, all I can really say is what, what our attorney had recommended to me. Um, I, I don't wanna have you find yourselves in a legal bind. Um, so my recommendation would be, would be to follow the process that he outlined for us. Um, the process that, that I outlined that I discussed earlier that came from the attorney, there's, there's, no, um, there's no protocol, there's no law or, or even a GRF policy that addresses this particular scenario when multiple people have a conflict over an issue, even in this case where a majority of the board potentially has a conflict with an issue. So what he was trying to construct for us last night was a methodology that would minimize your legal risk. And so this, we went back and forth. We talked about this for, for well over an hour late last night. And um, this is what, what we kind of, I should say, he really settled on. And, and I questioned it and to make sure I understood how to, how to do it. So this is not, if you don't do this, it doesn't mean that you violated the law or anything. You, you've, perhaps you've even, maybe you have even satisfied it by just having this as a discussion and deciding not to move on. Um, but that wasn't the recommendation that he said. He, he recommended that you go through the exercise and have the discussion, go through the exercise of asking for if anybody has a conflict uh, to volunteer it. If they do, that then just removes that person from, from further discussion on the issue and then on, on around pickleball and then for the others to go through basically one by one and ask the, re the other eight whether that indiv individual has um, uh, the board believes that would be a conflict for them to proceed. Okay, uh, Paul, uh, Carl. Yes, I have a, a couple of things. One is I don't believe there are significant conflicts of interest, but also there's the political optics. I've had a lot of people who are concerned that if people don't recuse themselves, that the board will be impartial. The second thing is I think there are things going on that I have never gotten sufficient answers for and as a consequence can't make a decision on pickleball. For example, I introduced the terraces as an alternative. That has never been discussed by the uh, planning committee and I have no reason, no understanding of why it isn't because I think it's probably the cheapest it can stay away from the creek, unlike uh, uh, the uh, dollar one, which you're going to run into exactly the same problems you have at Creekside. I understand that in other locations, there are noise factors, or in the case of, uh, of Eagle Ridge, there's absolutely no way to put parking. Well, let's, uh, uh, Carl, let me interrupt. Let's don't get into a discussion about pickleball. This is a discussion about recusing. So um, if I could go on, let me see. I haven't heard from uh, Dale, Paul, and then Dwight. Okay, I have just two sentences to read that I have prepared. I am not a puppet of any club or organization here in Rossmore. And the second sentence is, I uphold community-wide interests over personal preferences. Thanks, Dale. Uh, Paul? Well, I understand um, what Ted said, uh, you know, and Dwight, about how their personal integrity might, uh, you know, they might be feeling bad of that people would accuse them of not being able to remain objective in this issue. But I think the conversation needs to be had so that the community understands 
what a conflict of interest really is. You know, a conflict of interest, A, has to do with money. Am I going to profit from or benefit from anything like this? And that would mean that I have a part interest in a company that might build a pickleball court or, um, you know, I don't know, or something like that. Um, B, it means that um, someone has a, such a hold on me that I am beholding to them to vote in a certain way. And none of the clubs in Rossmore um, that I am aware of insist upon that of either their owners or their members. So these kinds of clarifications need to be um, clear. These, these kinds of distinguish, yeah, clarifications need to be distinguished and people need to understand that the only reason we're volunteering is that we want to make Rossmore a better place to live. We want to listen to everybody that's out there. And we, but we have to make a decision for the whole community. And if people don't understand that, then we're going down the wrong path. Just this week, we had a wonderful member of the aquatics, the chairman of the aquatics committee, you know, resigned because he just couldn't take it anymore because there are so many complainers and people blaming him for things that are beyond his control. The fact that we don't have lifeguards, he's not available for that. And so for people to be looking at us to be magicians and not to have some personal feelings about this, that, or the other thing, but to be able to make a honest, fair decision in an objective way is, is another thing. So I think that this, the, the conversation needs to happen. It needs to happen in public view. And then people need to understand. Very well said, Paul. Thank you. Mary? You're muted, Mary. I'm going to agree with Paul here. We, we need to demonstrate that we take our responsibilities, our fiduciary responsibilities, our relationships, and the fun things we participate in as a piece of who we are. And sometimes for many people, it can seem complex. So I would rather say, okay, let me prove to the fellow board members and to the residents that I will be a responsible, fair representative. Thank you, Mary. Uh, any other discussion uh, about this? Dwight? So, so I'll go back to one of my comments before. I see nothing in the conflict of interest policy that says being a member of a club is a conflict. So if we want to have this open discussion about what is a conflict, it should go back to the policy committee to define what a conflict of interest is. If, if our policy is not adequate, then okay, let's debate that. But I, I do not see, we're on a slippery slope. We are not, we don't have an abundance of candidates for board or committee positions. And if we want to start excluding people because they're members of clubs, write it off. This is a dangerous precedent that we're sending, especially talking about specific club memberships on this topic, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, I, I my thought uh, uh, during this discussion has been maybe this should um, really go to the policy committee uh, for a further definition of the policy, because, um, mm -hmm. you know, I have to say in um, this instance, if you are going to vote against getting pickleball or not getting pickleball uh, and you're a, an avid pickleball player, maybe you would sway a little bit more toward getting pickleball, but we're not even discussing that. We're talking about where it's gonna be, not if we're gonna do it. So, um, um, you know, I, what Tim, if we don't have this conflict of interest dis, um, um, procedure now, but go back to the policy committee to redefine that policy, uh, and do you think that's a way to go? Well, you could do that. Uh, you, and maybe that's 
preferred to have the policy committee take a look at the at this particular policy. But this issue is going to come up in what two weeks, two weeks from today. So the planning committee is going to have before them um, the feasibility study for for pickleball. So you as members of the committee and as directors of GRF are that's that's going to be the first crack at this as to whether or not so if it comes back and says it's feasible then the planning committee will have to decide whether to make the recommendation to the board to to proceed further with exploring the dollar property um, uh, as a possible location which would mean well how about we do this how about i'm going to go through the procedure now because i think we, we need to but then we will also send this policy to the policy committee to um, define it so that we can know in future times that we're not gonna keep coming up with this uh, anytime there's a discussion about anything, whether the, the, um, there's a conflict of anyone who participates in that sport. So um, I think I'm, we're gonna go ahead. So, um, so the first question I'm, I'm going to ask is there is there anyone uh, any director who wishes to voluntarily rec recuse themselves um, because of the discussion about pickleball? Seeing no one, um, so uh, I'm going to ask you all if there if anyone feels that they cannot be fair and impartial, working for the best interest of all the residents in in um, Golden Rain Foundation. Okay, I see none. Um, and I'm then going to ask everyone, do you believe that any of your fellow directors should be recused? And if you think so, then uh, why? So I see no one. And uh, so then I will ask each of the five of you whether uh, you can be fair and impartial and make the decision about pickleball in the best interest of GRF. So first would be uh, Leanne Hamaji. Yes, I can be fair and impartial. Thank you. Um, so ne next would be uh, Dwight Walker. I don't believe I have a conflict. So I'm Thank not you. gonna answer that question. Okay, uh, Ted Bentley. I have no conflict. Okay, Paul Meraki. Um, I think I can be fair and impartial. And the last is Dale Harrington as part of the substantial um, Rossmore. Yeah, I know I have no problem. I, I, I want to make a comment. I have one time on the board, I seconded a motion. And after I heard all the discussion, I voted against the <laughs> I, I voted against the motion that I had seconded. If that doesn't prove my ability to go beyond, I don't know what would. Okay. Um, all right. So, um, Tim, do we then need to yes, vote individually on each one of those? Could I interrupt for a second? Yeah. I th I think we need to ask every director if they feel they can be fair and impartial on this discussion. Okay. Um, so um, I'll go, I don't see any reason not to do that. So uh, Neva, do you believe that you can be fair, fair and impartial in discussing pickleball? Yes, I do. And Carl, do you feel you can be fair and impartial? No, because I don't have all the facts. Huh? Well, when given, when you get all the facts, do you think you can make a decision that uh, it is best for GRF? If we properly explore all of the alternatives. Okay. And who else? Um, Mary. I can be fair and impartial. Okay, and I'll state, I believe I can be fair and impartial. Um, I, I, Tim, I don't think we need to vote individually on all of us and have the rest, everyone else vote. So- I, I, think, you've, I think you've addressed this. Okay, all right, we're done. I turn this back over to Dwight.
had to unmute myself. Uh, I, I, Paul and Dale had, had questions before we move forward. Paul, oh, go, go okay. ahead. I just want to say that um, I've only been on the board for since May. Um, but in that time, I, and despite the fact that we've been meeting for the majority on Zoom, um, I have found that all of the directors, you know, I've gotten to know them better than I ever had before. And I have full faith and confidence that they can make an objective and decision um, that is honest and fair and transparent. And I think that is what this community wants and needs. And um, to my fellow directors, you know, if, if you need my uh, endorsement, you've got it. <laughs> we appreciate that, Paul. Dale? <laughs> yeah, to the naysayers out there, um, only Rossmore residents can be on the Rossmore board. You don't have the option of having the board be comprised of residents in Walnut Creek outside of Rossmore. Okay. All right. Next topic. Uh, we're moving on to selecting a department for service level analysis uh, next year. Uh, Tim, did you want to mention this? Yeah, so um, a couple of years back, uh, I guess early 2019, I guess almost three years ago now, the board had decided, we had a process for how the board was educated about the various departments. And, and when people get on the board for more than one term, because there's a two term limit, you get to the point our board directors were telling us, telling me at that time that they were getting to the point where they felt like they knew all they needed to know about most of the departments. And they didn't want to take up time at our annual board retreat to keep talking about the various programs of GRF. And what they wanted to do instead, they still wanted to be educated around it, but they wanted a deeper dive into the different departments. And um, so we came up, the board came up with a different model. And that was to um, pick maybe three, between two and four departments per year to have a, a lengthy discussion about and not during, just during the budget hearings. So, and the impetus for all of this really led back to the budget process and um, the frustration that board members were feeling, this is back, you know, 2018 and prior, that when it came time to do the budget, the first meeting in September, those two days, that if there was a change that the board wanted to make to a service level, there was no time to actually go through the process of having hearings about it with the community, you know, discussions, meetings, workshops, whatever. And uh, because you only have, I think it's six days typically between the budget meeting and the day we have to put the board packet together for this meeting at the end of September. So, what we what the board decided to move to was a thing where we we pick as i said two to four departments a year to, to take a look at so in your packet on page 112 this is item number 11 d um, the board has heard from over the last three years most of the little maybe a little more than half the departments um, so there's i have listed there the departments that the board has not heard from uh, which are executive services, human resources, accounting, handyman services, aquatics, fitness center, golf, facilities maintenance, vehicle maintenance, uh, audio, visual, and custodial, and then channel 28 in the website. So um, you can see there also right above that list are all the ones that we've done. So it could, now some, most of you are a, a large number of you, four of you are new to the board in the last year. So uh, you haven't heard any of those or maybe we heard, uh, let's see, we heard, all of you have heard the IT presentation, which was done in May, but, um, and Mary would have heard the landscape presentation and then that's it. She hasn't heard any of the ones higher up on the list that we've already heard from, the board's heard from. Now, Carl, who's been on the board now, he's in his sixth year. He's heard all of these ones above on that list, but he's the senior member here on the board. So you can either choose a new department that you want to hear or a couple of them or three of them or whatever or if there's a one that we've already had a presentation on and and you want to either hear again or you want to learn about because you're new to the board you can choose from the list above too 
So, um, so Dwight, I'll turn it back to you and you guys can deliberate which departments you want to hear from in the next year before a before your term ends in April. And Tim, is this something that we could ask everybody to send their choices uh, via email and we can yeah. review at the next meeting? Or do you want us to make choices today? Uh, it would be preferable to make the decisions today just because the staff have got to figure out how to schedule time to put these presentations together. And it, and it isn't something that can be done in an hour. They put a lot of time into these right. uh, to, to make a good, I mean, they'll spend a day or two uh, over time um, putting them together for you. And, and you, as the ones we've already seen, they're, they're pretty well done. I mean, they're pretty comprehensive. And so it would be helpful, most helpful to have it decided today. If you want to wait, because then we can actually maybe get one in before the end of the year, before the end of this calendar year, okay. um, e either in October or December. Um, otherwise, if we wait another month, um, there's not, we won't be able to get it done in December, which means we're going to cram all of it into the first four months of next year. Okay. So in the interest of time, how about each board member come up with their top three and we'll just go board member by board member and say what, what your top three choices are. Start with Leanne. Okay, um, my first choice would be facilities maintenance. Um, I believe that knowing uh, maybe some of the costs of facilities maintenance and which facilities uh, require the most, most maintenance. Leanne, uh, could I interrupt for a second? Let's not get into rationale. Let's just do oh, top three okay. choices, each board. All right, okay. facilities maintenance, fitness center, and then a repeat of public safety. Okay. Uh, Kathleen. Kathleen, you're muted. Okay. Uh, I would say vehicle maintenance, um, HR, and um, recreation. Okay, then Paul. You, uh, facilities maintenance, human resources, accounting. And Neva. Uh, facilities maintenance, fitness center, and HR. Okay, Mary. County, HR, and facilities maintenance. And Carl. I would, I think I would leave this decision to the other board members since I'm probably fairly familiar with most of these. Okay, thank you. Ted? MOD, recreation, and transportation. I've, I've sat in on a lot of meetings at uh, Peacock with some of the other ones. I'm sorry, that was MOD, recreation, and? Transportation. Transportation. Okay, and Dale. I didn't, I didn't print the list out, so I don't have it in front of me, and you haven't put it up on the screen to share. Um, that would be helpful, but um, I'll, uh, I've been listening to the ones that have been mentioned, and I would say HR, uh, recreation, and transportation. And, uh, and um, Dwight, I'm going to change my recreation to transportation. Okay, I think and that... And I'm going to change oh. my... Facilities maintenance to uh, MOD. I didn't realize we could choose from the ones that have been already done. Okay. And I'm going to do uh, channel 28, transportation and fitness center. Okay. So the only one that got five votes is HR. So that looks like a given. Neva, did you have another comment? No, no, no. I was just okay. expressing satisfaction. Okay. <laughs> and Leanne, are you satisfied or you want to say something? Your, your hand is up. That's why I wondered. Uh, coming in uh, second and third are facilities and transportation. So HR facilities and transportation. Can I see a show of hands? Is that satisfactory? I think we got it. All right. Last item on the agenda is um, a recommendation for the Fitness Center Advisory Committee 
Uh, Dale will tell you that Jim and I had a, a great meeting with some terrific candidates. It's really uh, heartwarming to see the people that step forward to be volunteers in this community. A very difficult decision, but uh, Dale and Jim and I all agreed that Krista Kell would be awesome to replace uh, Louis Benesca, Benegas, Benegas. Uh, do we, is this a motion or am I just announcing this? It's you. Is it? <laughs> it's a motion. No, no, it's, it's got to be. Uh, for the board. Yeah, the board has to vote. You, you get to a point, uh, you know, identify and the board has to vote. Oh, okay. Okay. I'll move. Thank you. Is there a second? I'll second. Mary seconded. Any discussion? We're ready for a vote, Deborah. Walker. Yes. Stumpo. Yes. Amaji. Yes. Kurt. Yes. Bentley. Yes. Brown. Yes. Clay. Eva Flaherty. Oh, yes. Thank you. Harrington? Yes. Mataraki? Yes. Unanimous. Okay. Thank you. Uh, there will not be a mid-month regular meeting uh, in the month of October, uh, but there will be the end of the month regular meeting of the board on Thursday, October 28th at 9 a.m. And now we will recess into executive session. We have a couple housekeeping items that we're going to take uh, care of before we um, uh, join the executive session, but you need to log out of this meeting and log into executive session. And let's do that at 2, 2.45, okay? 2.45. Thank you. Thank you.